John Eversley. Papa John. My dad. If you could Papa describe John. Papa John. Ah, oh, f me. <laughs> <laughs> You're just mad you don't have a Papa John. Nope. I got Mark. <laughs> Good old Mark. Go on. John Eversley, my dad, also known as Papa John. <laughs> as Sean likes to point out. If you could describe this dinner with racers in one word, what would it be? Very enjoyable. That's two words. It's true. Enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> and now for Dinner with Racers, presented by Continental Tire. With your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Placeholder Radio. <laughs> Welcome to Dinner with Racers, Season 2. I'm Ryan Eversley, alongside... I'm Sean Heckman! And we are on our way to LAX, so I can get out of this Honda Odyssey that I've been trapped in for 40 days across 29 states for 12,000 miles, all courtesy of Continental Tire. Cross contact, LX20. Now, this episode is very special to me because we interviewed none other than... John Eversley. Who is my dad. Oh, I've heard that last name. According to government records. So I uh, I wanted to get my dad on last year. We, we kind of want to don't put just our ideas ahead of like what the fans would want. But this one was special to me for obvious reasons. My dad's been a longtime crew chief in and out of the motorsport world. He was crew chief for Bob Aiken with the Coca-Cola 962 days. He worked with John Paul Jr. and John Paul Sr. as well as Paul Newman. He ran the Panos Project. A lot of things like that that really I grew up around, and that's what caused me to be the driver, racer, whatever that I am today. So I kind of wanted to tell his story more because I wanted it for myself because screw you. It's my podcast. I'll do what I want. And I also know that he's got to see and do some really cool things, and he never tells his own story. So I figured this was a nice place to force him into talking about his racing. We ate at Ninja Sushi in Brazelton, Georgia. I had a Hawaiian 5-0 roll as well as a rainbow roll and an avocado roll. Sean. I had the uh, chicken sandwich. I don't believe at you did. Ninja Sushi. Did you? Yeah, it's your did joke. You? Okay. And, uh, you know, dad was my dad. He's, he's not very out, outgoing about his racing background. but We hear about guns getting pulled. Yeah, guns pulled on mechanics. We hear well about as... windows getting kicked through. Right. Uh, and just the general good time that was sports car racing in the 80s. Uh, my dad worked with Nicky Lauda for a while, and so some cool Nicky Lauda and Hans Stuck stories as well as uh, Paul Newman's story from back then. And, yep. uh, you know, just neat things that I got to kind of see in here growing up, and I was happy to have the fans be able to kind of see where I came from. So so here's a glimpse into the Eversley family, courtesy of Got Nettle Tire. Meow. Meow. All right, we're going to start in five, four, three, two. So you'll pull up that headset right there. I got you some sake. So don't slow your speech. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just want to loosen. Want to loosen you up so you really tell me how you feel about things. What's happening, Dad? I'm just staying busy. Yeah. Fortunately. Now the the strangest thing to me <laughs> is that <laughs> see I have this pet peeve of Americans who use British expressions and phrases. Um, as though oh, they're uh, more international, but they're not. So, like Americans that use English, right? The Americans who have like no British background, correct? Yeah, will say that, and it's their like attempt at sounding like they're more worldly, and it just drives me nuts. <laughs> it's just fucking nonsense. Um, and uh, here's where I'm going with this: Is it ever Ryan? I can't say Eversley right now because there's two of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Ryan doesn't do that, and yet I say cheers. I guess you do say cheers. I say cheers a okay. lot, but people generally... I just think I like face Andy, all of that. Andy points it out. Yeah. But he's like, that's because you're dead. Yeah, but that's Some point. people like, point it out to me sometimes. I would like, excuse well, I just, it if you did, yeah, yeah. but you don't actually do that. And and I don't hear you going crazy every four years around the World <laughs> Cup to talk about football, well, and then two years later, I have no idea what the hell we're talking about. Yeah, no, we didn't so, really... We weren't yeah. a stick and ball sports family. Right. Um, just getting into it yep. from the get-go, like, you brought me back... From when you were working for Fitzpatrick, I think, out in Sonoma or s somewhere near San Francisco? Yeah, San Diego. San Diego. That's where the shop was. You would fly, for some reason, you'd bring back 49ers gear. 
Yeah, because they kept because there are so many people that worked with us, yeah. and they were in the same complex. Used to come over with boxes full of stuff, and so Max would just say, "Just take this, take this." Okay. So I said, "Okay, I'll yeah. take it home." But it's, no, I never went there. Right. So he, so he'd bring I've me never back. been to a football game. American, right. American football. football. American yeah. football. I've never yeah. been to one. I've lived in this since the 1980s. Wow. I had tickets to the Super Bowl. I gave them away. <laughs> but, what? Well, what? I, worked for, I worked for Ralph Kent Cook. But you Jack know how Kent. hard those are to get, right? Well, I did afterwards, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but I thought, I thought I'm going to do something else. I went out to the desert with the guys. It was a weekend off. And, and then somebody said, you did what? I said, yeah. I just took oh, – they, they, they couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I grew up a 49ers fan because he would bring home, like, 49ers swag from the airport yeah. or whatever. Oh, shit. Okay. And so yeah. I get this all the time where people are like, why are you a Niners fan if you grew up in Atlanta? I'm like, well, it's because that's what was in my bedroom as a kid. There'd be, like, little footballs right. and little jerseys <laughs> and stuff. I didn't even know Atlanta had a team. Right. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> just kind and of. And then the San Diego Chargers was one of a very good friend of John Fitzpatrick yeah. who would come to the shop every day because he had nothing else to do because he was retired and he'd just come down with a bunch of stuff and then but that would disappear quickly because yeah, that yeah. was local right ah, okay. yeah that was closer yeah, yeah. to san diego right right right, right. yeah gary garrettson neat neat people yeah interesting okay well so speaking of san francisco 49ers so i grew up in in uh, that bay area so yeah. i grew up a 49ers fan as well but for a very different reason hmm. so i need to justify to my own father why he's never going to be on this <laughs> <laughs> because i know it's be like well why is brian's dad on but i'm not <laughs> uh, he'll never say that. He'll just be passive aggressive about it. Be like, oh, like, yeah, really I listened enjoyed to Ryan's, Ryan's dad's, episode. dad's episode. But he'll say, yeah, Ryan's dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll hear about it for six more times. And my mom, who literally asked me to shut it off at one they point, they were in the car, and she literally was like, "Can you turn can this you down?" Turn it off? Yeah, he's like, "Never listen." It's my sh- okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but my point in saying all that is, mm-hmm. is that you know, whereas my dad has been in racing in a casual way, it's like a club racer. He, mm-hmm. you know, he never worked in the sport the way you have. So you're, mm-hmm. you're here. For those who don't know the, the legendary yeah. John Eversley, tell me a little bit Let's about sort of how you got into the sport and, and how long it dates back. 64, uh, Silverstone six hour. It was it was a historic race, but it was I went with an Aston Martin team because my family knew them and they were all ex Aston Martin mechanics from the 50s. They had their own cars. I was a tire boy and I had to wheel the tires, no carts, wheel them two at a time to Dunlop and it was a far end, and it rained. Right. It was raining on the way there. <laughs> it was raining the whole time we were at the track. I've, I've it heard was this, raining all the way home. I've heard the story before where it's like back in my day, we had to walk uphill to school both ways. That's yeah. what it started to sound like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was raining the whole time. We all had a good time. Uh, the car finished, which was unusual for, for something of that age at that time, but no crashes. Everybody finished. We loaded them up on the trailers, and or most people would change wheels and tires and drove them home. Nice. Yeah. So that's the first that's the first race you that's really That's the first went. race I did. How old were you probably? I was 12. 12 years old, so you're a tire guy, 12 years old. Yeah, it was uh, July. It was July. I was just turned 12 because, you know, March. And uh, Was that was normal, it? by the way? You're like 96 no. for 12-year-olds? Well, to well yeah, I mean, you d- if, the, if you go to the track and you're a kid, you have something to do. Mm. You do not think you're going there to play in the <laughs> snow or play in the, you know, and rain. You don't. You go there to do something. And uh, before that... I was given, if I went to the, my grandfather's workshop, it was right. Rolls Royce, and they had his own Rolls Royce shop, he'd give me a toolbox and send me off to take something apart. Wow. Just to take it apart. Right, right. And I said, well, I've done it. And when they said, now put it back together. Yeah. I said, well, why did I do I that? And he says, to keep you out of my hair, because you're always asking questions. Yeah, that, that was, the, that was the, the childhood story. The legend was dad took a Rolls Royce apart and put yeah. it back together when he was yeah. like 12 years old. Well, because well, so. uh, he th- had no choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my first race. Um, yeah, but, was but, then it, but then it went from there and it just progressed and progressed. I went to more and more races with, with teams that are people that I got to meet. A lot of stuff at Goodwood, um, the old track before it, what it is now, you know, sure. the Goodwood Festival and the Grand Prix track. Dealing with the track service more than having to deal with the cars, but dodge the pothole. <laughs> because it was all cornfields. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And if you went off, it, the corn beat the car to death because they were aluminum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Okay, so we go um, from from first trip at 12 to, yeah. you know, you well, end up learning how to weld and... Well, from well, first trip, 66, came to this country. Mm-hmm. My mother remarried an American serviceman. Came here to leave my apprenticeship, which I just started. Yeah. I just had about a year into it. And... Um, that was all the that was all the theory. There was no there was no practical at that time, so came to this country in late '66. Twiddled my thumbs up in Maine in Prospect Harbor. Went from London to Prospect Harbor. You talk about a culture shock. <laughs> so I went so I went lobster fishing and worked in the woods in the winter. 
Wow. Yeah, and then we moved and moved and moved. But that was, it. and this whole time was racing sort of the passion. That it you was a passion, and I was always with. reading about it. I was, tra- and back then, you know, media wasn't what it is. So That's I would, right. I would, I uh, subscribed to Autosport, and, yeah. I, and it, I'd rarely got it. When I did get it, it was torn and tattered, and sure, usually and got like wet, two months old stuck together. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then um, came south, um, ended up in uh, Maryland. Ended up uh, legal reasons had to go back to high had to go back to school or mm-hmm. refinish school, okay. and uh, so I sat in the back of the class with my twin sister and twiddled my thumbs for a year and graduated high school in Maryland and then uh, we moved to Florida. Now was being a teenager with an English accent in the in the late sixties what it would be like today because like right now that's a, a solid gold with the ladies. You're going to take some of this out for what I'm yeah. No. Okay. Well, <laughs> this is what <laughs> depends this, on this, what it is. Don't hold back. The well, stuff you want to take out is probably the stuff we're leaving in. This is what happened. Oh, here it you comes. You go to you go to you go to school, and nobody understood you. And next thing, I'm in the wood class, and I'm on a wood lathe, and I've got a wood chisel, and I'm making a piece. This guy comes up and hits me in the head with a wood mallet. Oh my God! You got yeah. nearly s- knocked my ass. You out. got shanked basically in school. In yeah. Yeah. School. Yeah. Like, and you've been there well, for like a day. By the time I got my, I didn't wear glasses at that time. By the yeah. time I turned around. I threw that thing. And the thing you had been making? The knife. The uh, chisel. The chisel. So you yeah. made the shank. The chisel. <laughs> and it stuck right there in the joint of the behind the nice. kneecap. Yeah. Down he went like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> I got thrown out of school. I got expelled. <laughs> they did Bleeding from the head. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah but that's like and there was actual blood. But yeah. that's basic prison logic. You've picked the fight <laughs> with the yeah. biggest guy. You yeah. prove that you're good. And, uh, and Based and these, on all my years in prison. And before, <laughs> <laughs> and before it could escalate, the t- teacher, Mr. Hamilton, he's a massive guy, he just didn't, he interjected, and, and I was the one that got thrown out of school. They didn't, I, and, and he was the victim. So sure. I just turned around and said, hey, it was his, it was his fault. He, he started all this, and, and nobody backed it up. Nobody. So do you think it was because you were the foreigner? Oh, yeah. When you're talking, right. all the girls want to hear you talk. Yeah. They didn't okay. like that. So oh, the yeah. guys, so that's did, so the, that's yeah. okay, so the guys resented yeah. you. Yeah. So it literally was yeah. new was guy like with, a, with a mouth new on. New guy with an, yeah. So you go off to, you were, you were like welding on oil rigs, right? And like fixing things like that. Bu- and building all the, all the support equipment to build oil rigs for the legs. The mm-hmm. legs were made out of concrete and they were hollow. And it was a process called slip forming. Okay. The slip forming is only done by a steel structure. Yeah. And the, well, it's nonstop until that's done. And you there to build the parts on site. You've got raw materials right. because there's no point in trucking them in because it was in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So well. the raw materials would come in on a barge, and then they would we would build them. And if they broke them, they were they were established. Is it worth fixing? No, scrap. Build another one. Yeah. And it's got to continue going. So you'd try and keep a stockpile of forms going, and they were massive. Right. They were 16 feet long, and then if they broke while they were in process, you would have to go in while they were pouring. So you had to wear breathing apparatus. <coughs> you were low down in a harness. You'd be welding while it's pouring. Right. That was a weld. Yeah. And guess who goes in? The young guy. The new guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I went out to an oil rig because I thought I'd try that. And I said, hell no way. Yeah. I'm not big favor of the sea, but boy, that was what, an eye opener. So where would you stay while you were out there doing that stuff? On the on the rigs or on? You'd stay on the rig, but then w- but we were on ground. Yeah. We, 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 uh, on, the, on, on land, just in big bunk houses. And then once those would parts were built, and then you'd also you'd have to build all the support equipment because it was specific to each one. They'd try and keep them somewhat similar, but they all had, a, had their idiosyncrasies. And somebody saw, and then they'd have different drawings because they, they were aged. They weren't all built at the same time, yeah. so the specs were all different. So you'd build something, and then 90% of the time it fit. The other time you had to go and make it fit. And so that kind of set the tone for the rest of your career because you became very... Yeah, I, I enjoyed the fabricating, yeah. and then I did welding technology, so I got that as well as, as, a, as a degree, but not anywhere near like mo- mechanical engineering. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say is this whole time, I mean, you're welding on oil rigs, but obviously racing is and where and you want to be. And making uh, not, not just the oil rig stuff, but al- also making what was neat is all the, all the, the living structures. Uh, y- you'd make everything, the frames for everything, so there's a lot of fabricating involved yeah. as well as well. Oh, yeah, you're basically right. building a, yeah. you know, a functioning environment. But my point is... You didn't, you know, you didn't learn what you were learning to, to work on oil rigs the rest of your life. Oh, it no, like no, you no, because I knew it was a contract. Right. Yeah. And um, well, I'd made enough money after 18 months and the contract ended. And we were given a few months notice to buy my apartment, buy my car. All yeah. I needed was a job to put food in my mouth. Yeah. Which, and how, and how old are you at this point? 
This was 72, so I was just under, it was 19. 19, you got your own place paid for, you yep. got your own car paid for, yeah. and yeah, you got the whole world ahead yeah, of you. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's like, I don't know 25 year olds now that have their own car paid for, their own house yeah. paid for, you know or what I mean? 37. So, What's the what's the next step after that? What like what happened after? Yeah, there was a BMW, right? Se Seventy two was a big thing. Yeah, um, there was a there was an ad in uh, Autosport. It uh, it was for Porsche uh, BMW Motorsports. Right, and uh, so you had to go to Chiswick, which Chiswick is a is a suburb. Well, it's just on the North Circular Road of London. So I drove up there, walked in, said, "I'm, I, I'm you've got an ad in Autosport and." public relations I had to sit down I waited for quite a while and they came down they took my they gave me a small quick interview and I uh, wanted to know what my education was and the guy and he looked at me and he he said you've got all this already so I said yeah he said when did you start I said when I was 14 oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, uh, he gave me the interview and said thank you and uh, he said that there were two job positions available um, and about three weeks later I got a phone call and uh, said uh, that I got the job but the prerequisites were things like you've got to be single no attachments passport ready to go in three hours huh. anywhere yeah I like that they could require you to be single I was gonna say now um, that would be a lawsuit it's not legal yeah. I yeah. actually think it's a great requirement in this kind of sport yeah, yeah uh, probably it probably save a lot of families. Yeah, they yeah it'll save a lot of family. Well, and it saves you heartache later on because when the guy starts bitching about more time with his kids. Right. Yeah, because you know, you turn around and say, well, 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 I've got yeah. my kids to pick up. I've got to take my wife yeah, to this. Yeah, you're yeah. avoiding that's all those now. hassles. Yeah, yeah. yeah but so, but uh, that's what started that. And then the BMW thing was just tr a lot of traveling. And, and which program was that, the BMW program? Formula 2. Okay. And Formula 2 engines and then the 320 eyes. So you're building motors or are you... No, just, the, just, just the stuff for chassis. But okay. you, take, you take engines to the racetrack. Yeah, and, yeah. and Formula 2 would be the equivalent of GP2 now? Yeah, and yeah. that would be your... And that would be the... Yeah, and that would be the... You know, that was now is an Atlantic car. Okay. So Formula 2 became the Atlantic sure. in this mm. country. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Simple cars. Mm -hmm. so, so around 1979, you get asked to be a part of the M1 Pro car. This was 78. 78. 78. Um, there was a... It was stay in England and not travel to Munich to work on CSL and stuff like that because they were all hand built at BMW Motorsports, which was a separate entity of BMW. Right. All motorsport cars, all M cars were built in one w workshop, yeah. very small. Um, and so then the M1 program was starting up and uh, they had to have somebody build the car. So Ron Dennis, yeah. pro car, Neil Trundle, Sam, right. Ron's, Ron's secretary, they. Um, they all got uh, they got the contract, and in that building, guess what? There was Formula Three, there was Formula Two, and upstairs we had an elevator was M ones. Every brand new M one would come streetcar, which is Pro Car, which was a like a subsidiary of McLaren, basically, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Because at that time it was Ron Dent. It was it was uh, it was McLaren was there, but Project Four. That's where Ron's office was. Yeah. That was a good program because it was get the complete cars. Objective was there's no time. They're in a hurry. In they're in a hurry. We've got to get all these cars built. So to get complete street cars, uh, zero miles, and um, strip them down, make a race cars out of them, but make them all the same because they've got to be they've got to be inspected. And this this was basically for if you're not familiar, this was kind of like the Porsche Super Cup at the time, right? Like yes. identical cars, all identical. And they would get Formula One drivers to come drive them as yeah. well as other. Yeah, there was. Uh, there was a handful of cars. The factory would have six cars, and they'd take them on open transporters for pub for publicity. We'd support every European race, yeah. Formula One Formula race. Formula One race, yeah. And uh, so, if the if the first fast if the first fast <coughs> fastest qualifiers of F1, they would get an M1 to drive in the M1 race. Well, if they've got their own ride, like Nicky did, yeah, or Stuck did, or PK, yeah, then the, you had nine. Then then you would have eight, nine, ten, twelve Formula One guys, right. And their objective is to get to the finish, and they didn't care. What Sometimes they, they <laughs> had to be harnessed <laughs> about demolition, but the well, uh, man, you always had work. And, and, and right. yeah. a lot of parts were a lot yeah. of parts were made. That program went on and on. It was good. Uh, Monaco was one of the things you never forget because it's like you do Indy, 
you go to India, you go to Monaco, you go to Daytona, you go to the 24 hours, you never forget because of the atmosphere. Yeah, it's such yeah. a big deal. People. Even though it's a pain because you've got no pit area, you have to carry everything, you have to walk a long way. Well, get, well guess what? When, you, when you're young, it doesn't matter if you have to carry two wheels and tires. Yeah, yeah. if you're in Monaco. That's yeah. your job, do it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, two of the stories that come out of that for me that I remember you telling me as a kid was Ron Dennis would, at like 4.50 every yeah. day, stop what he was doing, yeah. he'd come out, put on a like a yeah. like a coat basically and he'd help sweep the floors if you typically you're you're not a nine to fiver you work until the jobs are done because there's a specific amount of work that has to be done ron would come out uh you'd see him out he'd put a white coat on he'd start sweeping the floor cleaning the benches off um making and then ask if you look for food and he would be very present yeah he was there he was a part of what was going on because he knew the schedule as well and it took people to do that yeah it wasn't going to get done if you didn't have the people and not everybody's experienced at it but the ones that weren't experienced if you work with there's usually two to three people work together and the drawing department was upstairs they could see down yeah. so they were making drawings as you're going because it was an evolution thing and had to be done no no time to spare and he would come around and and then you'd see him during the day he'd have clients with him it was a business deal and then in the evening you'd see him with a coat on and he'd be sweet cleaning up yeah how closely did you work with him personally just that that was it okay. that was it i mean uh, but he he was right there yeah he'd ask you if you needed something and if you needed something he would make sure somebody got it in the meantime what else can you do right in yeah. other words that's not your only job right and he's always kind of praised the philosophy of everybody just contributes and there yes. really isn't worried and it seemed like that's it's true you know yeah. some people say it's a family but it, it's an integrated part and he tries to make you feel like you're part of it not just a oh make that yeah yeah he knows your name yeah yeah uh, there was nothing, you know, it's, it wasn't like oh, he, he just knew everybody's name and came up and chatted with you, but it's like it, if you needed something and it's not, he didn't want to be distant in any way, but he yeah. had a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. So the second part of that uh, is you got to work with Nicky Lauda. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. that to a lot of people is like pretty big deal. But you talk mm. about it like it's because you like the, the overall aspect. I'm of, looking at your face right now. You're like, eh. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. The yeah. thing about my dad is that he does not ever brag he's he's proud but internally he never well i did that and i did this like right. you have to yeah. pull it out of him well, but but photos don't tell lies and there's pictures of you guys at monaco with the marlboro m1 pro yeah, car there's pictures there's and pictures of us I, I remember there's pictures of us that uh, really stick out was when we had the problem with the cars at zolder yeah um they fixed it they gave us the parts to fix it yeah you've just got to stay there and do it you're right uh british grand prix monaco you just don't forget. Yeah, those if are you big start thinking about those them. are big deals, especially yeah. back then when motorsport yeah. as a general was massive. But working with him and he had this personal thing, this this fight with Regazzoni because they were so close in the yeah. yeah. And and when they're out the cars, it's like if you gave them a pair of gloves and put them in the back <laughs> of the, the, the pit, yeah. the paddock. Right. Oh, it was. But it was funny. Yeah. And um, and yeah, he's neat to work with. He was very blunt about what he needed. Yeah. And he would Dick, uh, Dick Bennett was yeah. still around and Kevin. Uh, it was it was number one mechanic, and uh, and uh, so Dick would uh, make sure all the information's written down. He'd have a job list done, old-fashioned way, paper. Yeah. Nobody got to see it except us. It okay. wasn't taped to the car. Yeah, it wasn't. This yeah, isn't yeah. public information where people walk up with cam. And they kept as many people out, media out of the garage area, or where, so we could get our work done. And this is 1978 or 79. 78, and even then, it was still super. Oh yeah. Like even yeah. outside yeah. of the trailer, you don't want because anybody to know because these cars on. are spec cars. Yeah. You could use one spring, yeah. one shock, one tire. Uh, it, but it's how you integrated it. You couldn't change the A-frames. You couldn't change the mounting right. points. You had air pressure people really know what you know a pound makes half a pound makes a difference well back and then when tire technology wasn't near what it is yeah. now you had to take and, advantage and the barometric and the pressures and they used to they used to analyze okay this is the temperature this is the barometric pressure and most people didn't do that yeah <laughs> so we had a slight edge but then having nikki yeah was the big edge mm -hmm. yeah. and he would get there in the morning he would come around whether you're under the car in the car upside down touch you good morning try and shake your hand yeah and leave you alone yeah and if there was an issue afterwards, he wouldn't come in the garage and go straight to you. He and Dick only, and Ron. That was it. That was the the group. Yeah. Then we would get to do it. It's just. But he would respect that chain of command. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. He 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 did that, and then the same thing at the end of the day. He'd come around and thank you. Um, if you had a problem, uh, what? Uh, how? Uh, are we going to get this fixed? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and but he he already knew the answer. Right. He just wanted to hear you. 
yeah. uh, have that feeling. Oh, yeah, of course we are. So. Yeah. Now, when you say he was the big bonus, was it his speed? Was it his feedback? Was it the whole package? Feedback, his speed, because he was still involved. Um, he had that. He had that. It's a char. It's a charm. Now to have to come in with that mechanical experience and that mechanical sympathy, and know when you shift it, there's something wrong. Yeah. He can feel it all the way. And back then it was solid linkage. It yeah. was a manual shift. But he'd come in and he'd say, this second gear, it's not, well, it's not in the gear, it's something. So you check all the linkage and you found that you had the, now he would like a, sometimes a softer spring on the detent. Well, it's, you can put an extra spring on the outside to pull it back to neutral. Yeah. So, and he would have those things. And then he was very, uh, tire pressures, he was very, very, very yeah. critical of. Yeah, very critical. So you told me once that he had some sort of deal where anytime he won, in the M1 car, he got like a credit with BMW uh, clothing or, or something, yeah. and he yeah. would take you guys all to the. He'd take us. To, he'd take us when we would go, go to Munich or he'd bring us by, and he'd say, "Go in the clothing store," and you'd get. I mean, I had. Anything. I remember when I first came here, I still had the BMW uh, zip-up uh, cardigan with the, all the emblems and the, the three uh, Roundel stripes, and I got the leather jackets, and then he'd come around and he'd just give us wallets, huh. BMW motorsport wallets, key rings, and right. and stuff, and. Yeah, it always it just come around and do that. It's just something he would do. But yeah, it's just sounds like a <laughs> asshole. <laughs> yeah. And he always and he always made sure that back then we had, and I've still got one pair, and I don't think they'd fit you because they're too small. But yeah. the, the denim overalls they were made by a denim company, and they're the BMW Roundel. And we have one pair left, and they were a zipper, and the pockets, uh, and that's what that's probably the only and pl the only other thing that's left is the uh, as they call them. They used to call them their anoraks, their ski jackets. Okay. That's left over. Yeah. Um, I think I've still got one of the hats back from then. Uh, but we were in a big hat deal. Uh, not like it, they give lots of hats out now. Yeah, but, yeah. but he was very, very uh, gracious to everybody that, um, that really worked with him. And he's yeah. portrayed in media, especially nowadays, that he's like this hard, well, you know, very well, He is hard guy, because when things didn't go right, sure. it, would, it, it wasn't, it's, he was ang angry with everybody. It's just got to get fixed. Yeah. So he had Dick to deal with. Sure. And he wouldn't be grumpy and all that. He, he and at the end of the day, it. even though he said goodnight, um, it wasn't begrudging. He wasn't trying to make you feel. He never made it personal. It was always business. Yeah. He's like, we have one goal here. And uh, he, is, he is an aggressive he is an aggressive person. That, the, that he never lost. But at the racetrack with the other drivers, when they used to kid and joke around, Stuck, PK, Regazzoni, um, and, 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 and himself, that it's all... They're, they're, they're just a group, and they're so damn funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because Stuck was always pulling like a prank. He, <laughs> he couldn't keep a straight face if he tried. <laughs> the racetrack was a secondary. That was, oh, I've got to drive. Oh. <laughs> and I've got to put my hat my, my hat on. You know, he crashed him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm feeding him in the car, cause he, uh, cause, uh, but he would do, he was reckless. Oh, God. Yeah. He would, uh, yeah, he had, to, he was, he was definitely blinders on there because he, the mirrors, pfft, yeah. mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because you're in a spec series and this is, I assume, the fun series for them. So they don't give a oh, shit yeah. compared to their and day that, jobs. Yeah, and that, so, so if the cars got damaged um, mm. and then it was a big fight to within a couple of races at the end, right. it was Regazzoni and Lauda, each one could have won. Yeah. And we yeah. turn up at the last race with two cars, a T car. Oh, yeah. so oh, now they oh, know oh, they can wreck it. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> they, well, they know they can wreck it, but if he got wrecked in qualifying, yeah, we well, wouldn't have a car because they weren't the easiest cars to fix. Okay, okay. and um, the parts weren't as plentiful as people think. Yeah, sure. So we ended up with a in the other truck. We ended up with a T car minus the the engine. Two things here is that the one is Regazzoni is a Ferrari driver at the time or or something. Yeah, no yeah. way in hell today would yeah, they would, would they a like Corvette driver be allowed to race in a BMW spec series yep. against a. Jag driver, or, or like, driver. would you they put I mean? Sebastian but Vettel in Porsche Super Cup? Yeah, like exactly. that's never going to happen. Never that it was just yeah. it was obviously it was a BMW promo. Yeah, yeah. But it uh, back then, you really thought they were trying to do something that's for the spectators. Today yeah, they called it for the fans. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it did. It brought a lot of people sure. out. Yeah. Uh, now it was the day before, and it was a hell of a end to the week because. Uh, but when they went out to race, it was quite a spectacle, and it was sure. had everybody up on pit wall. Yeah, right. and you still got all the in, all the all the uh, interaction from the people at the track. Yeah, and a spec series like that, which you know, for lack of a better expression, for the, for these guys, this is their fun beater series that they can go out and wreck the day before. Mm -hmm. As the guy that has to work on it, are you enjoying watching them beat and bang and have fun with it, or didn't are you just me. really did you didn't look at it as another win. two didn't hours of work? me. If okay. it happened, it happened. Yeah, and with the drivers of that class. You couldn't ask for any better. Yeah. 
they it wasn't his intention to go out. His intention right. was focused, and if he got caught, if he got the if he got uh, like a Silverstone, he went for the back. So then they had catch fencing. Yeah. Oh God! It just it tore the car to pieces. Yeah. Because it's just a chain link fence. Yeah. 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 And then they outlawed it because of the posts. But that was a big fix. Um, that would really require a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. required a lot of work. And uh, then Ron just got, you know, all the fiberglass. They just got it done, fiberglass and all the metal. I mean, it tore everything off. This so obviously, Lauda won the championship. But of that era, who was who was the man? Was it Lauda? Was it? Was to it us, it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. The only other driver I would have liked, to, if they were team drivers, was yeah. Stuck. Yeah. Because okay. the, 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 track, the, the track times, Stuck was very, very fast. But he couldn't keep it all together because yep. it always get tangled up with people uh -huh. stuck uh, but nikki had this clean smooth he could look through traffic yeah he wouldn't have to as we know you drive down the road you don't look at the guy in front of you you're driving down a country road at night you're looking way ahead you don't see mm -hmm. the only thing you might see is a deer but he he had this ability just to look through traffic he knew he recognized the cars immediately yeah who he could go by how he could go by them cleanly Always clean. It's tremendous race Not, not yeah. jump in front, uh, jump in front, and uh, t to make them uh, uh, break in, uh, uh, inappropriately. Uh, but always cleanly. Yeah. Wouldn't come back with the oh, I don't know how that happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> on the back of the car, tail lights hanging out. None of that uh, because they don't have this where you have the cameras on them and they d then they investigate and give right. you yeah, points yeah. away. Right. They didn't have back that back then. They had marshals on the corners, but they very rarely had this. Uh, the interaction what they have now with the with the, all the corner workers and the cameras and and everyone saying oh he did this well yeah and uh, but he always stood up for uh, what he thought was right and there was always people oh well that you did this and you did that or stop what and back then we had mechanical stopwatches right so yeah you were getting into electronic stopwatches but they used to use mechanical stopwatches uh -huh. in a row three of them on the on the that's what counted yeah and if there was any Ron was up there putting his foot down that's yeah. the way it is and th that happened you know, and we didn't see all of it because we were in the garage, but uh, it, that's how it was. But Stuck, um, PK was really fast, mm -hmm. yeah. but he was a bit quieter and a little bit more, and I would say more aggressive, smaller, s real small guy. Yeah. So shoot, you could pull his out, you can grab him by the scruff of the neck, and pull him out of the car, but, but people like Stuck, you couldn't. Yeah. yeah. But um, just uh, o overall, it was a good. And when people said, "Oh, you're working with Nicky Lauda," yeah, I'm working with Nicky Lauda. That's still now when I tell people that, yeah, they're that's like, whoa. Pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something that I think is funny is from the pro car, as you probably know, it was all Marlboro sponsored. Yeah. yeah. We had a Marlboro day at Brands Hatch. Everything Marlboro sponsored was there. Motorcycles, cars. Mm -hmm. And you remember, you remember how outrageous Hunt was? James Hunt, yeah. He turns up wearing a, an anorak jacket, <laughs> jeans with holes in them. Flip flops, yeah, scruffy old bastard. The look, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he's got women, and he's got, and he turns up, and they want him to. He's not, and he's just there. I think somebody told him, and they made sure he had a Marlboro jacket on, and they want him to comb his hair, and, and uh, he just got back from Spain or somewhere. It's like, do I really have to do this? <laughs> and so, they got him a driver's <laughs> suit, and they put him in the car. Okay, in the broker. Yeah, he said, is it okay if I crash it? <laughs> <laughs> I've never asked so, that before. So, you know, because he didn't really want to be there, and he was taking press people for a ride. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I I've been for a ride in the hope car. Hope I know where this is going. Oh gosh, no, but it, these, these, all these, all the newspapers were there, all yeah. the magazines yeah. were there, and the fellas would get in and they'd come back, and they had to be, they were locked up, they couldn't move. Yeah, in yeah. the car, but he brought them back. And uh, we saw him, because we saw him from the paddock, you could walk out the back of pits and you could see what he was doing in the car and he was terrifying. <laughs> and he's <laughs> laughing. As well. And he'd come back in and he'd get out and, and the, the person would still be in the car and he'd walk away and you'd have to go and you'd physically have to unlock him. <laughs> <laughs> and women, they, they inappropriately dressed. Yeah. They're in, and they were frozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely like, terrifying. How do you navigate he's your way out like of it? Right. Today, he says he's the biggest asshole in the world and all this stuff. But he was there just having a blast. He the motorcycles, it. I thought, were neat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. gosh, that's so fast to be right there next to him. Yeah. But that was a funny day. <laughs> and uh, and Nikki, Nikki couldn't be there, but that was a funny day for that. But yeah. we bought the car home in one piece. <laughs> is it okay if I crash it? <coughs> James. And then, and then the second one is uh, we came, we're on our way back from Monaco. And um, they, we always had to check in. 
with home base. They always wanted to kind of know where we were because we sure. didn't have satellite back then. And uh, we were told to go to Silverstone. So we go to Silverstone and uh, nothing there, bleak, horrible weather, overcast. Got the garage all to ourselves, and all these Marlborough people start turning up and BMW people start turning up. In comes a helicopter. Out comes Paul Newman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Test drive. But the way they act, treated him, it's, he was really something special. And as we know, he doesn't like that. And yeah. he's very... And I knew him from the mo- just seen him from the movies. And I uh, remember the, the year before because of, of, uh, of Le Mans. Yeah. And so he was a little bit more race-focused back then. Yeah, that's when he finished second overall, right? He, yeah. This would be roughly around that time. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was Dick Barber. Yes, yeah. and... Uh, uh, so Stomlin? <coughs> Stomlin, right? Stomlin. Yeah, yeah. yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, so. um, and, uh, and he comes in the garage and he's... And I didn't know when I looked who it was. And I'm working on just a no few things on the car. No, no, they didn't. We were just anything. working on the car. Yeah. And the mole were people or they had all these racing suits hung up. And I thought, how many people are going to drive this car? <laughs> they didn't know what size he was. Sure. So they hung all that, had all the helmets out and the gloves and the shoes. And... Um, and so he came in, and when he did that with his glasses, and he hangs them on one ear, yeah. I saw and the eyes. Know. I knew who he was. Yeah. Right. I said, damn, I can't believe You know, forget about Nicky Lauda. I can't <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was pretty neat. He did that test drive because he was looking for a car to run in the U.S., mm-hmm. right. not to run in Europe. Yeah. And he was in Europe for Monaco. So he to came make by. Well. Right. And, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, so that was pretty neat because he, the times were really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really good. And it just took adjustments of tire pressures and things like that. They made him comfortable in the car because he wasn't as slim as you and I know him from the Lotus. Yeah, because yeah. he was a bit fuller. Uh, but th- to fit him in the car, and it was it was really good. Yeah, good experience. Okay, so that's like that's eighty starting into the that's the eighties. That's eighty. Okay, yeah. so but you you're go. Still on, you're still in the UK this whole time. Still in the UK. Yeah. yeah. And then the M1 program, uh, I, I I saw an ad in Autosport again. And it was uh, Porsche team, U.S. based. And I thought, hmm. well, M1 program's coming to an end, came to an end. Uh, had a good time. And there was a job opening with VW to build British Saloon car championship cars, mm-hmm. Audi 100s. Well, they were all left-hand drives. <coughs> well, we had now to make for it Americans. Right Saloon cars <laughs> would be like touring cars. touring cars. Touring cars. Touring cars. Touring yeah, cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Touring yep. cars. Yeah. Yeah. They were street cars. They're just like what you what the ST, ST car is today. Yeah, yeah. And it was Richard Lloyd's operation. Yeah. But with Sterling Moss. Oh, cool. Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. You know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, we built we built some cars for them, and uh, and that was and I still kept in touch with with Arnie Ara- Arnie Arani. <laughs> was the guy in the U.S. and he worked for John Paul Senior. Oh, ah, okay. he was on the legal side of John Paul Senior. He was a he was an attorney by trade, but he did all the team. He was management. on the legal side. Always did his legal. All his took care of all his all of his legal affairs, all of his attorney affairs, all of his legal affairs when he was uh, trading because he was a big. Tra- John Paul Junior was, uh, senior senior. was a big trader. So oh, Artie was on that side. So he ju- he became his team manager. Okay. No, like a real trader. Like, oh, like stock market. Like a stock market yeah. trader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was he, he traded a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, so. he did. But yeah, yeah. But that we'll was get there. The, we'll <laughs> get there. They say some of it's legal, but I don't <laughs> even know that much. Back then, I think it's, 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 who, it's who you wanted to strangle. Or <laughs> sure. Yeah. So uh, I kept in touch, and um, there was, um, and he slipped out and said, well, he was staying at the Hilton. And so I didn't get an invite down, so to hell with it. I just drove there. I went to London. I drove down and I got to the Hilton. And I uh, called his room and he came down and we met. Is this the Arnie? Ardi Arani. Okay. And he was, he could, he was kind of well. I was trying to figure out who to call to come for an interview. I said, well, I wasn't going to wait for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I had the time, um, and uh, he said, you're a good candidate because of experience. Um, and uh, you seemed, uh, I couldn't believe you'd taken the step just to come down. So I said, well, it's not that far away. It's just a train ride and car ride away. And uh, he said, he told me that it would start by going to the Porsche factory, uh, working at Work One, where they built on the 936s and working in the same shops, and then going to the, uh, the Nürburgring, Silverstone, and Le Mans. So, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then after that, uh, after the Silverstone race, um, he said, would you like to come back to the States? 
Hell yeah, what have I got to keep me there? Nothing. So, so would that be JLP one or is that just a house car? Or that day? was the that was the car that was JLP one. Okay. Yes. Which um, was a Kramer K three chassis? It was a Kramer K three car. Yeah. yeah. And then it was all then it was all converted. Bodywork was it was it was an early car, then it had all the later bodywork on. So when it got to Europe, all that bodywork had to be fitted because it was bigger and that the turbos went from 26 k26 to k27s everything was bigger more yeah. boost yeah <coughs> <laughs> yeah um we had to change fuel cell um but it was all a new car to me it was you know when you take the body off it's it's just a piece of sheet metal right. underneath and what the rules required you to keep at that time um where there wasn't very much of the original car right the fuels were different and so uh, we had a hell of a time getting the fuel and the only thing that to make it work would be avgas. And yeah, um, what's that? Aviation fuel. <laughs> yeah, avgas. <laughs> so they so, so but the thing is, is, when they they got a couple of they had some uh, they had these English fellas, a couple of brothers, and I remember this guy's name's Chris. And uh, we had they took the truck and trailer from here, and by that time it was a Chevy with a chaparral trailer. And it was all in Europe, and, yeah. and right. uh, they they used the truck to run around. We used to go to the hotel in the evenings in it. This fella Chris and like I said, we had a problem with fuel. And I was on the way to the, I was in my own car in my little BMW. I was on the way to the track, and I saw the truck in a petrol station. Yeah, and they were filling drums up. Yeah. And then we had the problem with the engine, and I'm going to the logo on the totem pole, and I just said to Graham, I said. You've got this problem. I said, why did it happen? He said, well, we've got bad fuel. I said, you've got low octane. You've got low octane fuel. You haven't got avgas. He said, no, we've got avgas. I said, how do you know that? And he said, well, Chris went and got it. <laughs> I said, well, the last time I knew, you couldn't buy av av aviation fuel in a petrol station. Yeah. He said, what are you talking about? I said, they were down the road filling the drums up in the, you know why? 15 pounds a gallon and it's three pounds a gallon. Dollars, yeah. 15, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. where's the, yeah, dot, so right. where's the difference? Where's the money? It's, it's in, in Chris's pocket. pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay so, the, so we went through all the, we detonated all these engines. Unfortunately, having, we were working with Port, at Porsche, we got to go there and it was quicker to get the parts and Graham knew how to fix it because it was cylinders and jugs, but he had to go over so many times mm -hmm. yeah. and he was overworked. And we were at work one and uh, John at that time had one of his 6.9 Mercedes and uh, we were at the factory and uh, we were working and Graham said, don't go outside, Chris has just arrived. Oh. Well, by that time, John had found out what Chris had done. Oh, okay. This is a guy and that later on in life would shoot an undercover agent John six Paulson. times in the yeah. stomach yeah. and but not but kill him, but tried to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. But cool. we, were at the, we were at the factory. So this guy stole money from him. Yeah. But yeah. Graham came and he, and he blew up all these engines and they didn't finish the race. Right. But John, apparently, what we didn't know, had a 38 with him. He's outside, and he's got the 38 nearly in the guy's mouth oh, outside. Yeah, yeah. Oh. He's going to blow his head off. Oh. He did not. He, he, he didn't. No, did you go? I'll let you finish. I'm sorry. He didn't. He didn't even <laughs> stop or slow down. When you the, guys, it, I, I, it, Graham said, "Don't go out there," and, and he told us what was happening. He's, and he told Cliff, "Don't go out." Cliff's the Australian, and he went out there. She, he, nothing <laughs> stops. Looking like a sheep herder, he was straight Witness, through the door. Right. That's the second rip on Australians today. But he's but, but he's good guy, good yeah. guy. But he was very rash and but but straight out there. Got to see it. And, and uh, he, that's when he came in. He's got the gun he's nearly in his mouth and it's uh, up and against his throat. And and uh, that's the last time we saw Chris. He he never helped him get back to England. He never he took he, he made sure he didn't have anything to get back. Well, if you wow. think about it, it cost him how much? Not that the gun thing's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but he had, not that's okay. what I mean. But he had it but there like, back then. He yeah. still had it there. I, apparently, I guess he had it in the car somewhere. Right, right, right. Uh, like yeah. up in the dash. But, Jesus Christ. Um, and then. Uh, oh, because he, he shipped the car over. Because you car wouldn't be able to have a 38, that's would right. you? No, uh, no, right, no. But then you couldn't have guns. Yeah. Jesus, what do you want a gun for? <laughs> Just take a club and beat something. You don't shoot them. Right, right. We hit You take their kneecaps out. Yeah. So, John Paul Sr., who we now know today, had sort of many questionable dealings. Uh, were you guys aware of that as you were doing it? Did you kind of look the other way or just I, I personally didn't know what was going on because I was, uh, I was oblivious to it. Right. Oh, uh, but back then, uh, over there, we finished all our race and we came back to the States and that's when I was asked if I'd like to come back. I said, yeah, sure. Yeah. One thing of all the people that said about him and I haven't spoken to him or heard of him uh, in all these years, but yeah. he was, again, super fair. Yeah. 
Sure. You, if you worked, you got paid. Yeah. Yeah. He made sure of that, whether he was out of the country or where he made sure that somebody at that workshop, particularly his secretary, would make sure you got paid on that day. Right. Yeah. There was no hassle about it. Uh, I can't tell you how we got paid, but well, I can. You can just you got cash. Yeah, well, <laughs> he paid us in cash. Right. Nobody yeah. knew I was here for two years. Right. Wow. But after that two years, in '82, in '82, I had to get my minimum wage in a check, and then he paid you your balance. Ah, yeah, I see. Sure. In a little brown yeah. envelope, and he always made sure the envelopes were a little bit short so you could see the money sticking out the top. Yeah. They were. Well, <laughs> yeah, he, that's yeah. some gangster and, and, and he, yeah. and he <laughs> would and, shit. and he would write your name on there, and it was his handwriting. Yeah. And at that time, you know, Junior, uh, he, Junior was. Uh, John was very, very strict with his boys. Yeah. With Mikey, his youngest yeah. son, because Mikey, his youngest son, is a pharmaceutical dictionary. I mean, okay. Was it was just terrible, because John wasn't there to, and the kids were just left to loose. And, yeah. And uh, Tonya, his daughter, again, terrible. Uh, it, it, I, to, to see how kids grew up that way, yeah, with yeah, that yeah. with that much money, yeah. and, uh, and 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 to access. have everything, yeah. and then to just blow it all away because of dope and all that stuff. Yeah, and you'd see them, and it was like, hi, and she'd walk right by you, and just in a haze or something. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and and then Graham had come out laughing because Graham's engine shop was between the workshop, and it was in the air conditioned showroom. John would come in the in the in, in the facility. Yeah. Like the, like the police are chasing him, fly through the workshop in the, in the Mercedes, lock it down, close the doors, and you're working. You're <laughs> being chased by the law because you're doing 200 miles an hour up right. 316, which stopped there at that time. You didn't there continue was, on to... Yeah. yeah. And, and so... I mean, was his reputation pretty known then as well? Well, no, it's just uh, at that time, I was, for things I was finding out, you asked if I ever knew anything. Well, I didn't. Right. And then Phil Creighton, who I got to end up, ended up Phil Creighton, Transatlantic Racing, uh, and then became Essex Racing with Mike Gouet. Yeah. Yep, yep. So he's still around, but uh, I ended up staying with Phil and Fiona, and so I didn't have to live in a hotel. Yeah. yeah and then Phil right. started telling me about things, and I said, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, enjoying the I I'm enjoying the racing so much and the traveling. And, and you guys are successful. And, well, and, winning a lot and of we're stuff. having a good time. And yeah. so he said, he said, just just keep your head down when you're at the shop, and if any, if you see any strange guys come in, just don't take it. Fine. Just well, it. I assume that's part of the deal. Yeah. You just look the other way yeah, you just and just pretend way. like you have no idea. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Right. Especially at this so point. So you're, 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 you're working 10 o'clock. Hmm? How old are you now? You're like late 20s? Yeah. Yeah. So you're just like, yeah. oh, man, what am I doing here? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> this is Phil great, said, but I'm scared. <laughs> Phil said, if anything happens, I'll let you know, and you know where the airport is. <laughs> you can run back to so where you, <laughs> you could take right. off. Because for the first couple of years, you're still not legally there, right? That's correct. Wow. So um, I'm just here. And uh, I didn't have any intention of going back. I was just traveling around. Right. When you drive somewhere, you d make sure you don't go stupid and get pulled over. And yeah, so. yeah. But back then, they weren't checking for green cards. If you were a good boy, they'd leave you alone. Mm -hmm. I got plenty of speeding tickets, but I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do anything really stupid. It was yeah. just speeding. Yeah. And uh, and then I, <clears throat> I was in a workshop one night, and uh, I was there the night when one of these big U-Haul riders. I think it was a. That they call them Penske trucks now. Yeah, yeah. Came in. Apparently, it was full of bales. Yeah. Came out Louisiana. Oh, John, John, hot. Johnny was driving. Yeah. Some of our listeners don't have mm. the history of, of racing. Yeah. You know to what I mean? No. Yeah. And it was parked. So yeah. It so was parked. There's a theme it was that parked, may happen this season. Yeah. It was just parked in the car park. Yeah. Next to the rig. Yeah. Just which like was, you all was, filled with. Which was the yeah. X Shadow yeah. UOP. Oh. People know it was the long black. Ex UOP Shadow track and trailer. Long nose Kenworth. Yeah. Back then, big flashy. Well, it had been in storage in California. It arrived to us. All the chrome was rusty. So that was one of Dan's jobs. Polish that shit. Well, you can't polish rust. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so they, they got it all up to, and what they couldn't do, they, they ended up painting black. But it, that was the truck we okay. used. And wow. we ran all over the country. Because uh, the chaparral just wasn't big enough to sure. take everything. Sure. So this, this Penske and truck then, sitting out front. Sitting filled, out in the car filled, park, filled, yeah. filled to the brim with pot. And Phil then yeah. told me, he said, there might be some people around here tonight. We might not want to be here late. I said, okay. He said, I'll let you know. About 10 o'clock came by. John comes in like a bat out of hell, and he was focused on one thing that wasn't us. And Phil came out of the, his office and said, we've got to leave. Huh. There was a job list like this, yeah. and we had to leave. Yeah. yeah. So we left and came back, and the next morning it was gone, and John was gone for days. But one of the things, John would not use the phone in the shop. He had a, like a, I don't, I think it was a Crown Royal bag, to, full of quarters. He'd go down to the phone, the phone yeah. box. Yeah, it's completely logical. He ate at Waffle House, and that's the phone he used to use. He was, t he was uh, great. Yeah. He, oh, he was a big Waffle House, but he used to use the phone outside. Sure, sure. And um, so, and then 
Cheers. And then uh, Junior was just there and a hard working kid. Uh, he worked for his drive. He really worked hard for his drive. He was in and, the shop like every day, yeah. right? Like oh yeah, and all he wanted Fords to do was please his dad. Yeah. So you guys run the Lola T600 for a couple of years? Well, you, no, that we, was 80, then, 80, the 82 and then 82 I left. And you went to I, I went Cookwoods? To, no, I went to John Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick, okay, yeah, yeah. J uh, at that, that time, John was getting really bad. Senior, John Paul Senior. Yeah, yeah. Really bad. He'd come in the workshop and just pick on it. But one funny note is that I always wanted to keep the body work lightweight. Uh -huh. We got a pair of doors from Kramer. Kramer were doing the evolution thing. As thin as could be, and they were carbon, they were, uh, they were a, a Kevlar composite. Yeah. I hung the doors on the car, and they had to be fitted around the edges for bogey. So he had to do the next thing before they were taken off and painted. So I hung them, I put hinges in them, hung them. I'm underneath the car working, and John comes in one of his really bad moods. He walked out of his, out of his office, and he throws the door closed. It's all glass, with, uh, and the glass had to be the, with the wire in it, reinforced, because yeah. he kept breaking windows. It slammed the door, and he kicked the door closed. When he kicked it, his foot went right through it. <laughs> <laughs> and he came down on the ground and he, he kind of laid there and it, his glasses came off and I'm under the car and, it, right. and it, we're face to face and he looks <laughs> over and he never said a word. He just did this. <laughs> and he's trying to get his cut his leg to pieces. Right. On yeah. Yeah. He and he's just clean through it. And he just destroyed one of two doors. One of that only two. Yeah. 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 Like and there. he was on his way to bogey because the, because the doors weren't painted. Right. That what the. He didn't, but he didn't see me under the car. He may yeah, have said right. something to me. Why aren't they painted? But right, right. he told me he didn't say that. He'd just leave you to your job. Yeah. Right. And there again, he wouldn't say something to you unless you were directly. Is that your job? Yeah. I'm doing wheels and tires. Here. And he could never keep anybody keep wheels and tires because they were never perfect enough. Oh, the kids. Sure. Just yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Even yeah, though he was yeah. paying them high money, yeah. they right. would just jerk off. Right. So, this is when mom comes into the picture, right? Yeah, mum mu was the mum was the travel agent. Yeah, and this mom is when Jessica. And this mom. is when they used to deliver tickets by hand. By hand. Ah, and, right. And mum okay. would mum mum carried a thirty-eight because uh, she would do it with a lot of her clients. She would deliver the tickets to her corporate customers, and in this case, John would pay her in cash. Yeah. Right. So she. But nobody had to know where she knew where he was going, but she wasn't nobody allowed else. to tell anybody. Yeah. Yeah, you've um, got that much cash. Yeah, my mom you. was protecting drug dealers. Yeah. So yeah. Street cred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we met, and she was my travel agent as well. And um, talk about mom? Yeah, well, just a real quick background. Yeah. So basically, um, yeah. She had an apartment. She had a spare room. I needed somewhere to stay. She wasn't there because she was always doing fam trips, familiarization Smooth. trips. And when I was there, <laughs> she wasn't there in the other way around. Smooth. I know. You're not. No, you're way off. No. Yeah. What? He, he thinks that's how you got in with this her. This is the angle. Yeah, no, I don't no, 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 wait. no. Right. Keep going. No, she was just my travel agent. Yeah, yeah. All right. And uh, and then I went off to California, and uh, she wanted to come out and see me. And uh, then I came back, um, and then things said, then things and we talked about. Oh, you're telling. Well, I need to stay in the country. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I became. I was a true green card marriage. No kidding. Yeah, totally true. married wow. just for... Just, just a green card. So just for the... Yeah. Just platonic. Sham and wedding. And wow. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, we, so, we had it, so we had a wedding at that Grandma Pam's. Yeah. Which is... Uh, so... And uh, it was... Uh, got married to stay in the country. And I wow. went back off... I went back off to... Which was the thing to do back then, right? Like, wasn't yeah. everybody doing... Like, yeah, all everybody, the English guys yeah. were like... Yeah. I got okay. Australians yeah. and English guys were doing it. And yeah. Yeah. totally get so it. But how, how does that conversation happen? I mean, yeah, you guys... Well, well my mom's really cool. So she probably was the one that was like, "Hey, when they kick you but out, she just offered." Yeah, I knew it. She offered, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I said, and, "And I said I would pay her five hundred dollars." And she said, "Okay." Well, she'll say in a conversation if you get talking about, it, you know, she'll look at me and say, "You still haven't paid me that five hundred dollars." And I <laughs> say, "It's an escrow, honey." <laughs> <laughs> and that would drop it, and you'd carry on. Right. But I went back off to California, and um, and uh, John Fitzpatrick. Uh, I went to John Fitzpatrick, and then there was a job at looking after the Lola and going to Le Mans with the 935. You guys got married so you could get a green card. Yeah. But I'm... Then they started dating. I'm talking to the product over then here. Then they started of, of dating. More than a, a I was yeah. in yeah. California. She was in Atlanta. Yeah. When she would travel, she sometimes she'd stop and see me. And when I was coming east, right. I would stop and see her. Booty right, ball. but you made it sound like it was uh, it was an it was it a was. convenience. But so how, yeah. so where did where did uh, where did things pick up here? Well, things started. We started seeing more of each other. And we, she'd come to see me in California on her way right. to a trip. And we just got... To know each Started other. Started dating. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. dated, kind of dating. Marriage. It wasn't after a date, but. After the marriage. After the marriage. Yeah, yeah. After yeah. the marriage, that's okay. right. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah, to get married, and, I d and, and then, like I said, I left. And every time I'd moved, 
my immigrate because we got the paperwork going yeah they would you. put it on the bottom every time you go so if you leave the country they take your paperwork off you have to get what they call probation to leave the country okay. i'd go to europe i'd go to south africa yeah they would always take your paperwork and they'd move it so you'd say oh i'm going to atlanta now so therefore it goes on the bottom again yeah and then i got a really good immigration attorney yeah really good and he did made no he'd got it done okay. happy Fair. with that now I know. Okay. I just wanted to know because I'm hoping there's some smoothness here. Um, and then there's two. There's two more of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Tony, get me started. I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've met him. So uh, just to kind of sidetrack a little bit back to the JLP3, you yep. guys build this car. Yep. Bunch of you put it together. It mm -hmm. becomes one of the most successful GT cars of all time mm -hmm. for a single season. You win Daytona. We went. We went. We won the last two races, in 1980, and the yep. first three races of 81. We won. Which is Sebring, Daytona, and Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. And with with flying colours, yeah. nobody could nobody. How, how are you doing this? And they, the scrutineering was tech. Yeah, right. it was terrible. It was like, how are you doing this? You know. And back then it was he's faster where, and then the the weight. How much? How how can you do that many pit stops? Yeah. I mean, how, how many can you do that much mileage? We we just moderate our boost. Yeah. That wasn't the answer. Yeah, you're right. cheating like crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. what I recall is A, it's got a it's got like a not an aluminum aluminum roll cage? Chromoly, mm -hmm. something it's all it's all it, oh, it was all forty one thirty chromoly. Chromoly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't bad out of a DOM seamless tube. It was all forty one thirty. Yeah. And Mr. Wizard, Chuck Gay, who was Junior Johnson's fabricator. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, and okay. Rabbit. So he knew his stuff. Oh yeah. It's uh, Chuck Gay was named Mr. Wizard yeah. and for a reason. Five o'clock comes at that shop. Out comes a Budweiser. There's more work done from that time to midnight all day. than yeah. all day. <laughs> and it's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Never put a wrong tube in the car. Absolutely gorgeous. Graham Bertels was in charge of all mainly the welding. Yeah. And that's Rabbit. Yeah. And it was absolutely gorgeous. And so didn't and you guys run fuel lines through the roll cage? Uh, we ran... <laughs> That's not a we, no, by we the way. Ran, <laughs> we ran. No one's no, going we, to. We ran okay fuel now. tanks yeah. in the rockers. Fuel tanks in the in rockers. The rockers. Took, so you had to keep the rocker yeah. and the door open. Yeah. We ran. F we made fuel tanks and went in the rockers. Yeah, right. And the airlines that were in the car, the only airlines, you, the, the lines you had in the car, air equipped, were for the air jacks front to rear. Yeah, right. Well, you couldn't see those, so they thought the airlines that were in the car, the lines that were in the car were airlines. Well, they weren't. They were fuel lines. Fuel lines. To an and we had an extra pump. Yeah. It was like a small pump down in front of the pedals, yeah. which you couldn't see because it was underneath the fuel tank. Right. And at that time, there was nothing to say. You had to strip the car. So we had a little pump in there. And uh, so... For tech, would, you mean? They wouldn't... They wouldn't, they wouldn't tech. That's right. Yeah. And you, it was run off of... And then it was run off of boost. So it was a boost. It was a boost operated yeah. switch. Yeah. And so when, you, when you're off the boost, it would pump the fuel. <laughs> And so you guys were able to outrun everybody on fuel well, do, mileage. Do a, and do, you're do, a, do, a, do a lap here or there more. A lap or more, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but you had to do it very, uh, today's the words are strategically. <laughs> um, but uh, then, and then, uh, then they, they kind of got wind of what was going on, so we took those out. Right. And by that time, we were, we were well led, and uh, we could run more boost um, for short periods, but they knew what they could do. Yeah. Right. And when you say strategically, I assume part of a, a, a cheater car is is to not break the rules so, or to not beat everybody so blatantly that they have to look. Correct. Through. You don't right. just go out and run off and uh, and and then somebody say, "Oh, well, you got 20 seconds on." They'd always make sure, you know, win by an inch. just enough. Just just just, just, just win by an inch. Johnny, uh, back off, and then uh, Junior, uh, the old man, would get out of the car. The old man, opposite Jenny, and he'd have his helmet off and stay right there. None of this take his suit off and sit down right there into it with you. What's this going on? What's going on here? In the pit right. stop. Oh, yeah. 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 Right in pit lane. Excuse me, right in pit lane. He'd just throw his helmet down. It didn't matter. And he'd be right there and he'd want to see everything on paper. Mm -hmm. And he'd be up there. Didn't need a calculator. Everything was, he was sharp. Oh, yeah, sharp. Yeah. yeah. This is our pit stop trader. Yeah, yeah, that's it. He'd get out of the car and tell you what the pit stop strategy is. Right. Yeah. The guy was clearly a numbers guy. <laughs> yeah, he was a numbers guy, and not the kind that wants to write his numbers down. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so he had his draw it, but his, it, but his, there was nothing, nothing clinical about his drawing. He just scribble on it and just hand yeah. you this. Yeah, yeah. None of this block. Just give me a piece of paper. So you guys win Daytona, you win Sebring. Yeah. You win Road Atlanta. Oh, yeah. That's pretty much unheard of. I have the 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 stats on that season right here, which are pretty incredible. But basically, you guys won. One out of the three races that car entered. Mm -hmm. 
you 27 races entered for JLP3. Nine wins, 16 podiums, which is one victory every three races is entered. 60% rate of finishing on the podium with that car. Yeah. And at that time, also the beginning of that year, we started running the first Lola T600. Yeah. Apart from Cook Woods, which was Brian. Right. Was that 81 or 82? 81. You sure? No, it, uh, uh, 82. 82. We ran, ran the eight, 81, we ran the, the 935s. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the 82 was the uh, was the Lota T600 first year. Right. And that was because uh, Bruce Levin had one, um, Brian Redman had one, and John Paul Jr. Ours was chassis number two. Right. Because uh, John paid extra money to get that. Because the English love money, so they took his money more than gave Bruce the car, even though Bruce wanted his more. Bruce, Bruce Levin was uh, Bayside Disposal out of Seattle, Washington. We're going to have a picture of JLP3 on dinnerwithracers.com which is, if you follow me on Facebook, it's my my headline photo on there, but it's one of the craziest looking GT, or, uh, you know, 935s of its GT generation. Car. Uh, that GT car was car. a GT car. Exactly. Yeah, it's the blue so and yellow one. It's the blue and yellow yeah. one. It's, like, iconic. It's a big part of our and family why, history. And why that color? John was colorblind. <laughs> really? Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. You but can see green. Yeah. <laughs> you can see yeah. money <laughs> and <laughs> weed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you go, to, you go to Bob Aiken. Yep. Uh, your crew chief with him on the 962. Well, I came over as a mechanic to, yeah. to build the car because it was at Franz Blum's Racing's Workshop in Tucker, Thomas, Steel Drive. His son Thomas now runs Flying Lizard. That's right, and yeah. he's got yeah. a very successful strategist. Yeah. Cool. yeah, super young kid. Um, worked in that shop with Bill and and but Franz and Bill ran their street car shop. Mm -hmm. They needed somebody to bend the back corner to build these to build this this car. Plus, they were having Fab Car build a chassis. Yeah, and so I got the. I took over from kind of Jack Ansley from the Coca-Cola days. Yeah. That was in 84. And then they built the new chassis at Fabcar. Well, they didn't build the whole car. They built the chassis. That came over. So it was build all the brackets again, fabricate all the little small pieces yeah, inside, yeah, right. make the body fit uh, how we wanted it. They just kind of stuck it on. Yeah, it works. And then it was all Porsche suspension. So it was off the Porsche truck if you had a problem. You didn't yeah, fabricate. Yeah, yeah. But, but it was, uh, your, the, but but it was the a lower fab tub. The fab car tub, yeah. fab car suspension arms, and uh, some little bits and pieces that David likes to make. He's yeah. really good at doing these idiosyncrasies to the car. To me, Bob was a gentleman racer. And then he would get you know, people like Stuck yeah. and Wallach. Right. Real good guy to work with as well. Well, he kind of sets the tone for today's gentleman driver. Because he was a yeah. you know, wealthy business guy, but also took his racing very seriously, could compete at a high level, got to do a lot of big races and big things. And, mm -hmm. and he's kind of like who I reference because he didn't need driver rankings. He was happy to race against factory efforts. Mm -hmm. he's yeah. Like, yeah, I don't. Oh, yeah. You know, we had John Osteen in the car and Jim Mullen. Yeah. And the, the, the body damage was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what we'd go through, and then Jim turns it on its side. He goes over the guardrail, it and it's in the woods on its side at Elkhart Lake. Elkhart Lake, right. It's stuck in the trees there. Didn't it go up in the air? Was that where it went up in the air? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it went up, and it got stuck. There's a video yeah. on YouTube of the thing in the woods sideways between trees resting on it's it on the, on the body where people are trying to yeah, figure it was, out how to get it, it, out. Was, it, was a, it was like, will it come back with anything on it? It's, <laughs> could you focus on <laughs> And Jim was uh, very much of a gentleman racer, but he had enough money to give Bob. And John Osteen was uh, was very fast. Right. And from the smaller ranks of Porsche as well, 924s, 944s. Sure. Um, that was our driver lineup, and then we'd get then we'd get people like Stuart. Um, and then Super. Yeah. Super guy. He's the man. So you run the Coke thing for a couple of years. You start your own shop, Global Motorsports in oh. Atlanta. Yeah, in 86. And then... Uh, don't really do a lot of race. You do like club racing and adventures. Just some and club racing. And, yeah, and, and you'd get like I, almost every year. It seems like somebody would hire you to go to Daytona and yep. help out for the Rolex or, or whatever Sebring. Uh, yeah. So then, uh, while you're doing your thing, you end up with Lotus Sport and the Bridgestone Supercar mm -hmm. Series, which yep. was also based Lotus North America. Was and that based was Jack Hensley. Jack, Jack Lawrenceville. Hensley, Lawrenceville. Yeah. And Lakes Drive. Yeah. Some of the drivers you got to work with were Doc Bundy, yes. Bo Lemler. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Carradine from Nerds. That one guy, Paul Newman. Oh, that guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that guy. And so a uh, story that will always be very important for my childhood was we, when Lotus Sport was kind of shutting down, and that was kind of like what Bridgestone, or it was kind of like World Challenge GTS is yes. now, basically. Yeah. You know, it was kind Escort. Of, yeah. Escort, Escort, World Ch Escort Challenge, yeah. And as that team kind of started to shut down, Paul still wanted to do one more race at his home track at Lime Rock. Yes. And so I'm... I want to say 10 or 9 years old, and you were driving the truck and trailer up 
one car effort and we yeah, go we're using up. we're using our truck and trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and we go up and we we i'm nine <laughs> we go up and support the uh the race at lime rock for paul's and they had a, they had a motor uh, uh, an rv at the track and we were on grass and yeah yeah, yeah and um and uh paul but was just wanting to race and where did we stay with paul's at their house yeah yeah with him and his wife yeah. joanne yeah so we did that weekend, and he ended up crashing out in the downhill. He dropped the wheels coming oh, out of the front yeah. right in front of me and had a big crash. Yeah. Um, but we got to spend a lot of time with him, and he was super yeah. friendly and loving. And Super and friendly, and, so and was there was time when you would – because you had your bicycle with yeah. you, yeah. and Paul kept taking it. Yeah. And you thought somebody had stolen it. Yeah, it's like <laughs> and we got him, robbed. And he's, and, he, and, he's, and he's riding, but he's not riding in a straight line. He's just riding just like you saw him in Butch County. He's riding left to the right. Yeah, he's and got his he's standing casual, on the seat. And you just – treat him as a person that's what he wanted yeah. and when the cameras came out he wanted to get away yeah sure but sorry, when sorry. he focused on when he was talking to you his sunglasses were off and he was looking at you yeah, he wasn't right. seeing and then one was that was done he was gone yeah yeah because it was too much click click yeah, click yeah, yeah, the yeah, shuttles. Around. yeah 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 we shared the rv with him so i'd be eating cereal with yep. him you know and he's like mm -hmm. oh he kept calling me kid that's all it was just and kid, then he took kid 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 I think you still have. I do. It's hanging in my living room. It's uh, when you bought a Lotus Alarm back then. They Street had these green, green note, the green uh, Lotus uh, green with yellow Lotus paper. With Lotus paper, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was just a folder, and that's we had all our notes in it. And he took it, and he, he wrote on it to the fastest kid on the block, to the new hot kid on the block. block. and he signed it. PLN. And he didn't sign signa He didn't right. sign yeah, autographs. Yeah, he do it for that. kids apparently. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's hanging in my in my living room. It's one of my most yeah. prized possessions. Yeah. First thing I think about if there's a fire, I grab that. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first oh, yeah. thing I grab on the way yeah. out. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you got to work with Bob or uh, sorry Paul, and that was a unique story, yeah. for, obviously for you, but in a, and especially for me, because mm. um, I didn't know who he was other than the race car driver Paul right. Newman. So then going to school the next, you know, oh, a yeah. month later, I wrote a but my yeah. summer vacation that's thing. That's right. Like, this weekend I got to go to Paul that Newman's house, with Paul Newman. and yeah. it, right, and my teachers are like. Bullshit. Right. This kid's an idiot. And uh, yeah, my mom had to come pick me up for one day. And they're like, by the way, Ryan wrote this really interesting story about how he hung out with Paul Newman this weekend. She's like, yeah, and Joanne. <laughs> you know, they're like, what? <laughs> okay, so just to finish out the career stuff on the for the very cliff notes now because we've been talking for so long. Um, you end up basically you have your own shop. Guy comes into it one day smoking a cigarette, asking if he can get some roll hoops made for his street car that he's building. And you make prototype roll hoops for the Panos Roadster streetcar. Yep. They like them. You say, okay. And they mm -hmm. say, we want 50 sets because it had to be. For well, the it wasn't that many. But, yeah, but to start making parts and uh, didn't know who Danny was, didn't know anything. Started making parts. And um, at that time, we were just looking after some higher-end car stuff that I'd started. Like the Aston Martin stuff that I'd worked with in England. That Panos relationship from building the Roadster parts. They, they kind of come and look at the shop. They see all the neat stuff you have in the shop. You've got RS200s. You've got well, Chevron B19s. <coughs> yeah, and Ferraris. the Cobras, the GT40, yeah. chassis 1010. Yeah. Um, then, we got to, then we had the, the championship winning the uh, 65 uh, Cobra in there as well. Yeah. And the F1 car, the Tyrrell, which was ex bell off. Yep. Two RS200s. Yeah, I remember that. So they yeah. see that and they go, okay, this guy knows race cars. So We're building a race car. Well, so what they did was he was – Danny originally approached me and said, my dad wants to bring one of the cars over. And Danny was Panos. Danny yeah. Panos, sorry. Right. Uh, approached me and said, Dan wants, dad wants to bring one over. And I know you've brought these RS200s in. And was, uh, what's, what's got to happen? Because I got, I got ripped off by a company and I had to pay a big bond and never got my money back. I said, well, yeah, you bring it under a TIB, Tim 3 Import Bond, for six months. Boom. You've got to handle that. <laughs> Do so that for me. The next, then a few days, I met his dad that Saturday at, at his shop, and, and Don said, okay, well, this is what I've got. He said, I've got one of the cars at, at, uh, at Dams. We're running Le Mans, because they have two cars. I want to bring that over, and I want to run it at Road Atlanta with Doc Bundy. And Andy Walls. Yeah. Andy Walls. Well, they won the race. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Don says, we're keeping the car. Yeah. I said, no, it's got to go back. So we sent it out the country. Uh, to Canada, and then Dams had to build another car. Well, we had to go to Raynard to build a car from nothing. Yeah, it was like when the part was literally finished, it was bolted on the car. Where's the next part? Twiddle your thumbs. There's another part. Yeah. So we managed to get a second car for Dams. So because David Price wasn't giving up any of his parts because they were like hen's teeth. <laughs> um, he gave a few bits, but not too much. So built a second car, kept that car here, and uh, started. And he asked me, "Can I run the?" So, 
here we go again. Yeah. I didn't want, really want to go back into motor racing, but it was a chance to start that. And, and so we bought the Lotus tractor trailer yeah. uh, from, uh, from Roger Cates. Pretty much took a lot of the guys from the Lotus program yeah. and Andy, brought them over yeah. Andy Waldrop. Yeah. And yeah. Now, one of the prize drivers of, that, of, the, of the Panos program was oh, yeah. one John, Johnny O'Connell. Uh, oh, yeah. Who we uh, who we oh, just yeah. had lunch with a little bit earlier today? Yeah, and uh, we have a segment that we where we pass along questions from one guest to the next to the next to the next. And Johnny had a question for you. Uh, you have that written uh -oh. down here. Somewhere. Yeah, the question was, how much did you go out of your way to help your boy with his career, meaning me? I didn't have to go out of my way because you did most of it yourself. Yeah, that's kind of what it we says. Like you didn't. We have to. supported. Well, you helped we me. Su we supported you in the fact that mum would go out of her way. I was working. Mum would go out of her way to make sure you got to where you needed to go because of uh, driving license things and pick you up that evening, uh, make sure you got there. I think I rarely took you there and dropped you off, but I didn't get out and start snooping around the shop. I just dropped you off and right. off I went back. Now, there being Archangel uh, Motorsports. Sorry, okay, sorry. So yeah. Archangel, yeah, so Mike Johnson. So Ryan, yeah, right, and I, I got to meet I them. That, I got to meet them, but I didn't want to get involved. Right. Um, I had enough to do. Uh, I'd, I'd, at that time, uh, it was kind of, I was stepping down a bit. But no, we didn't go out of our way and push you. You grabbed it and took it. Right. And you made what you've got. Yeah. Um, if we could have, you know, the shoe, if the shoe's on the other foot, if, 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 if we just shoveled money into it, I don't think you honestly would be where you are. Yeah, possibly, yeah. Um, you might have a known name, but it's, to me, it's more satisfying in what you've done yep. for me to look at. Yeah. And mum, oh God! <laughs> so she's well, proud. It's, it's not like you yeah. could have spent the money to, to right. get him to, to afford right. the rent no, that you needed. No, no, no way. No, we, no, we did what you're doing. So, to the to the question for Johnny, like you did, however, give me a last name that could get me endorsed. You know what I mean? Because when I would call people or email people, I like like uh, Brad Kettler. Like I every time I walk up to him until he kind of knew who I was, I'd say, mm -hmm. "Hey, I'm John Eversley." So he's like, "I know who you are, Ryan." You know, but like yeah. if I was just somebody sending emails to all these teams, which is how I got my first job with Mike Johnson, I was literally on yeah. the Internet going, yeah. hi, I want to clean wheels. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, I yeah. want to be a driver one day. Um, but I could say my dad's John Eversley and they'd go, oh, yeah, versus like, hey, I have no ties to racing whatsoever. You and know, so it helped me. It, it's You're going to get the call back because it's not some unknown person. And to me, well, that just happened. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, I'm happy that people recognized it for sure. you. Sure. Uh, but. You know, like you said, I, I, it, it, what happens, happens. Right. And um, Well, and, yeah. and, and to put that on the other side of, of the foot for a listener is that, yeah, you had that in, but that in could be solved for anybody a couple steps along the way. You just find your skill set that's appealing to somebody. Yeah. In your case, they are willing to listen to you. But if you have a skill set that somebody's interested in, in learning from, for example, I shouldn't turn wrenches, but I know how to make good videos. Right. And that's how I got into the back into the sport yeah. years later. Uh, and so I would hate for somebody to be like, oh, well, you know, yeah, he has a last name. Yeah. No wonder. And that's not that's not good. Yeah. Enough, oh, no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But it definitely uh, helped get a return phone call. Absolutely. You know, from yeah, people yeah. or when I was especially when I was trying to find rides, I could say, hey, Kevin Doran. Right. My dad's John Eversley. He's like, oh, OK. Yeah. yeah well, so familiar. here's because was it clear that Ryan, that you wanted to be a driver or just that you wanted to work in the sport? Uh, because here's where I'm going for, for for you, John, is obviously you you lived and breathed in the sport for a few decades by the mm -hmm. time Ryan came around. Yeah. Um, you know the challenges that can come both as a mechanic and especially as an aspiring driver. Yeah. Uh, was there a side of you that maybe wouldn't wish that on on one of your kids, so to speak? Becoming a driver? Uh, yeah, or just sort of knowing what challenges lay ahead. In other words, no, like, because you know, it's a big challenge. Right. Needs, you have to have a challenge to get anywhere. Right, because but I'm saying Ryan didn't go to college, right? No. Yeah. And and a lot of parents would say, and no, you're gave, going to but college. But he, he gave up on that. Right. But the thing is, I'm not saying you're always too old to get an education. Sure. But if you've got the opportunity to do what you love, right, and your heart's got to be there, there's no point in sitting in the classroom. No, I agree. Absolutely. So going to our next guest will be Calvin Fish. And you've known Calvin for a while. Didn't he work with the team at, at maybe? No, I didn't work with him. Or um, he drove He drove the car once yeah. or something, right? Yeah. yeah, he drove the so Panos or something. Did a but anyways, you're familiar with who he is and, and know he's been around. Any any question you could think of for Calvin Fish, whether it's what did you have for breakfast? I was something that's really simple. I don't know, but why did Calvin stop racing? There you go. That's, that's excellent. It. Cool. Uh, yeah. d d whether it, whatever it is, but why did he stop racing? Sure. A, a not I don't think he should have. I mean, it's obviously a, a choice, but why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
there's a name I'm going to put out here, and if you're inside the paddock, you know this name, and as a fan, you might not, but can you tell us a little bit about the legend that is Decal? <laughs> Who is Decal? I don't really know his, I don't know his real name. Paul Kelly. Yeah. Paul Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who is he and what is he? Like, get, like okay, he would. What tell, is the great? Yeah, tell the story of Decal, like yeah. as you would see De it. Decal would showed up. It would show up. He would get to a racetrack by roughly what time? Like eighties, in the eighties. Yeah, in the eighties, he would turn up at every racetrack and then look to work for somebody. But he would work for pettants. <laughs> he would end up fueling a car. He'd sweep the floor. He would work for just about nothing just to work on a race. He team. just wanted to be in race, and he was the scruffiest. But it personably, if you talk to him, he's a real personal guy. Right. But he's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> he's so annoying. I, I mean, I he's, I he's, like he doesn't go away. I mean, you're trying to get something done, and he's talking to you. And and and, and I just and I never knew. I say, Decal, I've, I've I've got to get this done. Okay, I'll see you later. And 15 minutes later, he'd be back again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he says, "Is there anything I can do?" And I say, "No, I'm fine right now. What I'm doing." And then all of a sudden, you'd see him. Haul in tires for somebody, yeah. and he was scruffy as the scruffy covered as dirt. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll describe him in 2016 because he's still around. Yeah, uh, you know, he's always in some beat up hat shirt. Last yes, yeah, last time I saw yeah. him, was nothing's changed. Um, nothing's yeah, changed. It, yeah. So I saw him at Petit. Yeah, yeah. No, he's yeah, still yeah, yeah. around. He's absolutely still yeah. around. But but anybody who knows him, we'll, we'll, I don't know if we'll be able to share a photo in the on the website or not. But for those who don't know Decal, um, you would think he was like. I don't know how to put it. He, you think he's like a homeless super fan? Yeah, right. The way he walks right. around, you yeah, really yeah, would. Yeah. Uh, but he's this guy that's been a staple of the sport as long as I've been in it. Yeah, I mean, he's been around since the 80s. Okay. And he is Imps's transient. Yeah, yeah. The original that's a great way of Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he would work for like a t shirt and a decal, right? Isn't that how he got the name? Or, he would or work or he would a suitcase work for or something? It just had his bag. But how he got, and he had eventually got a car, but he would thumb it. He would uh, he would wash what trucks is, and trailers. What to is get thumb it? Put hitchhike. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so he literally he'd, would hitchhike. He would, he would literally track ride track. in the back of a truck, in the back, out in the open, from track, like, from or, or, from or any jump on a train yeah. or d anything. Because yeah. if you knew the race was there, okay, that's my general direction. That's how am I going to get there? I don't know. Uh, there's a right train track. It would go in a rail car. For the for the folks at home, this is not a cartoon character. He's that's an right. actual person. Actual yeah, yeah, yeah. person. Didn't he have like a briefcase with stickers all over it? That's how yep. he got the nickname, mm. Decal or something. But I remember you told me a story once of how like you were pulling out of a track and it was like a back-to-back -back weekend or something. And as you're pulling out of the track at late at night, you know, the race is over, everybody's tired or whatever, and you've got to overnight it or mm -hmm. something to the next track. And he's hitchhiking. Yes. At the front gate. It might have been like Watkins Glen to Road America or something. I think and that was the Daytona. It was the Paul Revere Daytona to Watkins Glen the next day, and we'd all have to drive overnight. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because we had a race overnight, and then we had a six-hour at Watkins Glen. That coming weekend. Yeah. And the story you told was that he was at the front gate, like, trying to get a ride with some of the teams, yeah. and you guys didn't pick him up. Yeah. And then you got there, like, the next day, and he was he, already... He was already there. <laughs> <laughs> he got there before us. And he still got a smile on his face. Yeah. <laughs> but proud of it, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if he ever did actually work for John. Uh, senior, because I think he annoyed him. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he would he never knew who he was working for because, and then eventually they would give him a shirt because th they didn't really want him to be associated with the team. Right. But then they'd give him a shirt, and very rarely he would get a jacket. But he was uh, toes sticking through his shoes, <laughs> and yeah. totally worn out, no <laughs> soles left in. Yeah, and he would be right there. Right, right, right. yeah. yeah. So Decal, uh, he worked for Compass 360 as a fuel person, couple of fuel guy, mm -hmm. a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, yeah. and that's how I got to work with him. Yeah. But I remember you came to one of my races, and you turned the corner and see him, and you go, Decal's still around? <laughs> <laughs> he blew your mind. You're like, he's still here? Yeah. Huh? yeah, that's the legend of Decal. I wanted to, I wanted to point that one out. So, last story is, you and I got to work together, and this is actually something you did help me with my career. You took mm -hmm. a loss on building Nissan Sentra's for Mike Johnson at Archangel. Yeah. in return for me to get to drive. Yeah. So that was something he did for my career, which was really important. Yeah. And so we had to work together, not only as driver and crew chief, but then when Mike was driving, I was kind of like a team manager, and you yeah. were a crew chief. Yeah. And I'm 22, 20, no, yeah, 19? 19. 19. 19. 19, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was a really interesting work environment. And then on top of that, the cars were delayed because of parts from Nissan we had all these well, yeah you had all these promises and yeah and, and then we had 
had to work a grocery car to make it work on the racetrack. Yeah, it was. It was our first race was our best result, which was. Yeah. Or, or sorry, our first race we did at Barber <laughs> Pouring Rain. Mike Johnson driving. We ran eighth in ST two. This is when there was two ST classes. Wow. And this was the shitty one. <laughs> and we and, they, and the rule book had sucked to the cars, and they yeah. wouldn't listen to what we needed. It was. It was pretty much what it is now. So. Um, we go to Barber and our truck driver, because it's like a throw together team kind of thing. Yeah. And our truck driver forgets to turn the airbags on and the ride uh, for, <laughs> cool. the, for yeah. the riding quality of the, ba of yeah. the, the truck. So one of the cars, well, the only car that was done at the time was sitting on the bottom it's of the trailer bouncing, and it's right. bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And it finally bounces up and lands sideways in between the two yeah. things. Oh, and wow. so we get there, we park the rigs. It's like, here we go. We're going ST racing. All right. And as I'm like, dad's like at registration or something. So I'm like leading the, like we're unloading the rig yeah. thing. And as I go to lift up the lift gate, the back bumpers of our car said Nissan across the back of them. So as I lift it up, I read Nissan up and down. And I'm like, Ugh! and I just closed the door back down. I was yeah. like, go get dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of our guys who's volunteering goes and gets dad and he shows up. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to see this because yeah. we're going to look like when you see that this car is sideways. Right. And this is when, like, there was Facebook. Broke, broke, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. 2000. Broke the straps. 2002 or three or something. 2003, I think. Yeah. No, three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so the we car's sideways. It's just like, oh, my God, we are wankers. All and the so coach work was smashed. Yeah, in. all the uh, brand new race car, and it's all it's, it's destroyed before we get there. Right, right. So we have to, like, get the car to, like, get up and over on the thing. And so the, the joke about my dad as a kid, we used to have paintball camp out, so we'd have all the kids over. Yeah. If somebody broke a gun, like something broke on a paintball gun or, or whatever, he could fix it with a, quote, old English trick. That was, like, my friend Clay's thing as a kid oh your dad's always got some old english trick or old english tool that he sure. can fix stuff so in typical john fashion he's got like a jack on one corner and a jack on the other with blocks of wood and they're like teetering and everything he's like all right two pumps on that side one pump on this side yeah. and what he's trying to do is get it to fall we, and we land we get it to jack it and let it fall back on it yeah because it went down between the yeah, ramps and sure. we got then once the two wheels were on the ramp we could then jack it up yeah and then we had to we had to balance the car on a jack of front and back and get them to move over so it was a couple yeah. of inches at a time and the car was actually on the ramps then because yeah. the truck wasn't fitted for that narrow of a car. Sure. Yeah, we had to fit. We had a prototype truck basically yeah, right. for a race transport and we but fit a it had, car in it. From the ramps, it went down between the, the wheels of the tractor trailer onto the ground. Yeah. And it was like... So as we're jacking it up, Mike Johnson's standing there, no faith. He's like, no, oh, yeah, no, 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 it won't no, work, won't no, work. No, and, no, no, no. and it's like, dude, the car's already f***ed. Yeah. Like, what are you worried about? Yeah. Scratching the paint? So literally he's jacking it up, and, and, and the whole plan is like, it's going to fall and land perfectly on the ramps. And Mike's freaking out. He's like, no, 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 no. Clunk. Lands perfectly. And I was like, old English trick. Got it. <laughs> so fast forward to that <laughs> season ends, thankfully. And then we go to do... Daytona and Homestead. Um, Homestead, yeah. And uh, I don't get to drive at Daytona, and I was pissed about it. Yeah. And then both cars had problems, so it worked out fine. And then at Homestead, I was going to drive with a guy named Robert. I can't remember the guy's name now, but he was a touring car guy from World Challenge. Gentleman guy, nice guy, super friendly. And we kept breaking fifth gear because our cars were turds. Yeah. And uh, so right off the bat, this guy goes out, and he breaks fifth gear. And so it's like, all right, we and we need it. We're shifting into the – this is at Homestead yeah, on the oval. Right, right. We're shifting so to fifth in, like, gear NASCAR turn yeah. three. Sure. Yep. So he goes out and he drives for, like, an hour, and he comes in, and we do the driver change. It's a three-hour race. And I get in, and they're like, yeah, just go drive. You know, like, do the best you can without fifth gear. And I get in the thing. As I'm pulling out of the pit lane, I've driven this car a bunch now. I tap the foot on the brakes, and when I tap it, the pedal, like, almost goes to the floor. And I'm like, uh, that's never happened before. So – we get the, going. The driver guy had never told us. Yeah, not a cl not a word. You know, he's just like, wow. yeah. Just like, Here so, you go. So I'm pulling out of the pit lane. And I'm like, and I'm. This is my second, second car race of all time. Third, my one SCCA form of the Mazda race. That's Mazda, yeah. VIR in California, and then yeah. now Homestead. This is my third race of my life in a car, and uh, and I'm in ST, which is awesome. <laughs> I'm like, how'd you get a license? So uh, I'm pulling out of the pits, and I'm like, hey. Uh, the pedal's like rolling really far down and it's I haven't done a lap yet and they're like okay do the best you can so I get going and I'm driving around and we're way off the pace because of the fifth gear thing and we're fighting for 22nd in class out of 23 or something stupid we get la this now we're in ST1 they bumped us up which sucked even worse because we sucked that in ST2 you were in much faster cars yeah. yeah and Lally's out there and like the Lexus lapping us you know right. and, it, and it was really rough but it's like hey I'm driving in a race and I, I didn't care that I was like you know yeah. inexperienced and I didn't think it was unfair that I was a pro in an AM class, you, you know what right, I mean? Right. Like it's just yeah, like go just race, driving, dude. Right. Go drive. So uh, about halfway into my stint, so there's maybe an an 45 minutes left in the race. I'm like coming down the front straight, breaking into turn one, and the thing would like turn to the right. 
because it, um, it ran out of left side brake pads. You know what I mean? Nice so I'd be going into one, and I'd blow the turn one. I'd go up on the banking, come down through the grass, <laughs> and, like, make it into the turn two. And I'm like, this is something's this is wrong. <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening. So finally there's a yellow with, like, 10 minutes – or, sorry, 20 minutes to go. Yep. And they're like – uh, go ahead and uh, we'll come in and we'll look at it. And so it's Mike Johnson who runs Stevenson Motorsports now, if you're not familiar, who helped me a lot with my career. And my dad mm -hmm. are standing there while they like, like dad takes off the left front wheel and someone else is taking off the right front wheel. And Mike's got his head in the window and they both look down at the rotors. And my dad's face is like, oh, like, no. And Mike looks at it and he's like, OK, like just like nods, <laughs> like like affirms it. Like, mm -hmm, yep. OK. And they both look at me and dad's like. Don't go. And Mike's like, good to go. Clear to go. Clear to go. <laughs> and I like I literally. Said, got, I said, there's no brakes. I pull, Nothing. I pull out of the pits, like looking at both of them, like the little kid. Like, does, I'm like, what? Should, what? You know, and I just drive out on the racetrack. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know what, what do to, you listen to. What do right? I do here? Yeah. Dad's like, no. The boss is like, yes. Yeah. And they both know racing. So like, right. I'm, I'm, I don't have a clue. So finally, like we get going again and there's a yellow pretty quickly for a car that ran out of brakes and crashed yeah. in the turn five at Homestead, the middle back yeah, straight away. The yeah. They're like, okay, full course caution, go ahead and catch the pack. And I'm right behind Joe Fox. And it was in a Porsche that he was driving with Tracy Crone. And they're like, catch the pack. And I'm like on Joe Fox's bumper. And we're going pretty fast, but it's yeah. yellow. And you've got you your know? brakes, right? Well, I, I, I did the last time. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, ended the, I made it through the last <laughs> corner. And I oh go down man. into turn five under yellow at like 100 miles an hour. And I pressed the brake pedal. And it might as well have been a clutch pedal. Because it went to the floor and it came right back up and nothing happened. And I was like, <gasps> so I'm pumping, pumping, pumping. I'm like, there's like nothing. It's like, f you nothing. There's yeah. nothing there. Right. And I, I'm like, ah. So I downshift fifth to four or fourth to third to try to slow the thing down. Wang, right through the rev limiter. Like, doesn't right. do anything. And I'm like, ah. Go third to second. Wang, like, right. I'm not slowing down. And I'm literally pumping like crazy the whole time. I go into the gravel trap. I hear two things. I hear, ch -ch -ch. that's me skipping across the gravel track. And then. Boom! Right into the tire barrier. Under yellow, the car they're fixing is like 20 feet to my right. Good job. Yeah, so under yellow, nice. I go stuffing it into the thing bigger than shit, And like huge crash. The car goes up in the air in the back, slams back down. And I'm like, okay, well, that's my first crash. <laughs> you know, pretty solid. Mm. 100 mile an hour impact in a wall. Good to go. Yeah. So um, I get out of the car, and it's pretty close to pit lane to where I was, so That's I just, right. I left, you know, I'm yeah. like, okay, I'll walk back, and nobody's like, you need to go to the emergency center, or anything no, like no, that, no, 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 no. Yeah. like, literally, I'm like, okay, and I walk back, so, they go, and they get the car on the flat toe, and they bring it back, and they drop it off, and Johnson gets in it, and he starts it, and he's pissed, he's yeah. pissed because that I didn't drive it back, <laughs> 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 he's not, you just, he's like, he's like, still runs, you could have drove it back, come back, and yeah. I'm like, it doesn't have a brake pedal. Like, there's fluid in the tires because the brake puck yeah, it had, this, yeah, yeah, it right, had a right. center piston, and the piston pushed out. It had melted the rotor or the uh, pad over it like like an ear, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and it was it, – it's welded together. I still have it. It's welded together, brake and yeah. rotor piston, piston, and no fluid left in the system whatsoever, which is why the thing was going to the floor. Right. And Mike's like, you could have drove it back. But you could have. You could have drove it back. You I was could've. like, a a and then what? <laughs> <laughs> like and then, then the man that was paying all the money – Wayne Press, Wayne Press yeah. was not impressed. He was not too happy with that. Thinking about the uh, like the Panos experience, do you th is there a reason that it's not more public that uh, Johnny O'Connell should have been hit for attempted murder? So you're familiar with how Johnny O'Connell tried to murder Dario Franchitti, right? Yeah, yeah everybody yeah, knows yeah, that story. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so we don't need to go into that. Tell, tell the plane crash story. Oh, in front of the house? Yeah. Well, you move to the country and people tell you, oh, it's really quiet out here. <laughs> We've had so many car accidents out in front of the house. People turn around in our driveway and doesn't even look back out in the road. They get hit. Yeah. People getting hurt. And it's just Kids rolling cars over in the front garden. It's just a straightaway, too. It's just a simple straightaway. It's a straightaway. Yeah. And one Saturday afternoon, walking up through the pasture, and I hear this awful noise, and I look up, and there's a plane... Because we live right next to an airport. Right next to it. Our, yeah. our property borders two runways. The guy took off, apparently, didn't lift the yoke enough and tried to uh, miss the trees at the end of the one of the runways, clipped some trees with the right side wing, tried to make it back to the airport, and came down and clipped two trees on the adjacent, our next door neighbor's property. Right. And I just watched it. I just watched the guy. It tore the left wing off. This car, the plane nosedived right in our front yard. And... It happened so fast, I thought it hit the front of the house. Right. 
I ran through the house and I could see it burning in the front yard. Yeah. So I ran back out and. Didn't you, you know, think? I think you told me that you thought the because I was at Laguna Seca that weekend for IMSO as a mechanic, and I think you said that you opened up the back door expecting the okay. living room to be on fire. Yeah I, yeah, I opened the back door and I thought the house was on fire. There was that there was so much fire. I'm looking right out the front window. Yeah. So I ran down and and uh, the smoke was incredible because all the plastic was burning. Yeah. Tried to kick the window and get in. My next door neighbor arrived, Mr. Patrick. Mr. Patrick. Yeah. Gave me a hammer, and I just went into the smoke. And uh, I remember you cut your your index yeah, knuckle and your ring yep. knuckle, everything down to the bone. Yeah, right, th sliced the, right through through the windshield, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I got the door open, it was just such a mess in there, and it, uh, and then uh, I just couldn't even get it. The flames were incredible. Yeah, yeah, I had to back out and and just recover because my l lungs were full of that smoke. Yeah, and uh, they told us afterwards that the fella died on impact. Yeah, there's yeah. no way he could yeah, have. Yeah, couldn't have done no, They left that whole thing there overnight. Yeah. And to close the road, uh, sheriff's guards, sheriffs guarded it, and the next morning they then cut him out. Yeah, which is just incredible. In the daylight. Yeah, and that, if you Google it, like Winder plane crash or something, there's a picture of it's a shot straight down Highway 82, and you can see the tail sticking out really? of the front. Yeah, yeah, because that's all that was yeah, left. I looked it up a couple of years ago, and it's still up there somewhere. Um, but it knocked the it knocked the fence down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and. Um, that's when the DOT made us put the fence back at right. said it was back at because it was at thirty and that was a grandfather thing. Well as the fence got knocked down, we had to move it back to fifty feet. But then I remember they like didn't want to pay to replace the fence or something. It was like a no, nobody replaced pain it. In the, ass. the people yeah. that the insurance company argued with us about it. I said <laughs> Over told, the them, fence, yeah. told them to go to hell and just built a new fence. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've had a pretty interesting si like time at, in Winder since we moved there, and I still think mm -hmm. it's mom because she's gone through so many crazy stories in her life. She's the she's the nexus of crazy yep. shit happening yep. that we're all surrounded by. Because yeah. we had the guy it's get shot across the street, across the street, five o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, and the old lady on Mother's Day got drove 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 off the road. She went down the ditch, flipped upside down, and landed on the fence post. The car pointing skyward. Yeah, the fence post was right under the engine oil pan. And all she wanted was a little dog, and a dog was thrown out in the accident. Oh. And the little dog was just sat there on the grass waiting for her. Oh, dog oh. Was fine. dog was fine. Dog was fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, all I heard <laughs> was that dog Nolly. in that whole story. <laughs> a little yeah, collie yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She couldn't get out the car because the car was skyward. Right. It was on Mother's Day. Right. Yeah. And a drunk drove her off the road. Mm. Uh. Yeah, we've had some interesting times there. And then uh, mm -hmm. if you follow me on social media or Lally or you have for a while, uh, about five years ago, we started blowing up propane tanks oh. and all sorts of stuff. Don't you owe me? You're the one that's like, "Hey, I brought another car down there for you to shoot up." Yeah. <laughs> well, we took we took one of the central bodies down. That's right. One yeah. of the ones we couldn't use. Yeah. Yeah. The the cars that cost us a dollar, we had it left over in the central program. Yeah. And then that I'm in the workshop one day and <laughs> and uh, look up because didn't always leave the gate open to the shop and there's some sheriffs up there and they're oh, talking. Right. So I say, "Hang on a minute." So I walk up the driveway and they're setting this. What was it? The Pi 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 pyrite, what's that chemical? Oh, uh, yeah, not anth anthracite. I always say anthracite. It's thermite, the thermite yeah. targets. Yeah, yeah and yeah, they're yeah. doing that in propane bottles. And this old <laughs> lady apparently called up and said, "There's a there's bombs going off over at the airport." Yeah, somebody's and then, bombing. And the then airport. we had other co had quote unquote complaints from these na some of these neighbors about uh, the, all the gunfire going off. And um, <laughs> I uh, I said, to, and there was two and then there was three and I looked down the driveway and there's five cars and they're out of sight all the way down to the street the driveway's full of sheriff's cars yeah. and they're all walking up the driveway where are they so I said well they're all down in the back pasture and they said have they got ear hearing protection and so I said they've all got hearing protection and they've got the shooting glasses on and I said back there having down in the in the in the hole at, at, uh, at the lake have they got a berm to shoot into I said yes and he said well we need to go down so mum's come out, and I said, we need to call the boys to tell them to stop shooting. Yeah. Well, as far as I remember, they, she couldn't get through to them, and there all these sheriffs are walking down there through the pasture. I said, make sure you lock the gate because of the horses. And all of a sudden, this lot open up everything they've got, and these guys <laughs> hit the ground. <laughs> All of them hit the ground, and when they came back, they were laughing about it. But at that time, they weren't because we just, they yeah. didn't know if they were shooting at them. Yeah, right. Right. where that was coming from. Because yeah, right. 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 yeah. I didn't bother going down. I thought. And, and then we're on the road. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah we were shooting the opposite direction of the house, obviously, yeah. which is where the berm is. But the berm um, and the lake and everything. I remember we 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 just happened to unload a bunch of rounds mm. like right at that point, yeah. just as the cops showed up. Well, yeah, but yeah, we didn't know they were there yet. No, right? I understand. So uh, I I checked my phone because it's it's calling, and it was either your shop number or I think it was your shop number yes, actually mom. because I I uh, I knew it, I knew there was a reason you were well, calling. Well, she she you know came I mean? down like to the shop. To tell me, I said, "Well, call the boys." And I walked up to the sheriff's, yeah. and then 
Yeah. Yeah. So I see Dad's shop calling. I'm like, uh oh, like something's up. You know, because they know yeah. we're down here, obviously. Yeah. And as I turn, I see it calling, and I turn and look towards the house, which is, you know, a half mile away or something. Yeah. I see these five sheriff walking side by side towards us, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, yeah. what have we done? Um, and then it turns out I went to high school with one of them, this kid David. That's right, yeah. And so I hadn't seen him in forever, and, and that was really funny. But the neighbors are, like, pissed because they're yeah. making us. And by the way, they shoot, too. Yeah. And this is in the country. Like, this is what yeah. people do. And uh, – they, they came down and they're like, oh, you got a berm? You got hearing protection? Yeah. What do you got shooting? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. They were all in. You know, they're right. like, cool, let's see it. You yeah. know? So it was pretty funny. But, yeah, we've had some good time with that property. Just a couple racing things. Uh, where, compared to where you were at the time, where do you see the sport headed? I mean, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never be back to what it was. Um, there's, there's so much regulation. Um, but I feel that they're doing such a good marketing job. They're trying to do a good marketing job and to try and get people involved in it. Um, I don't think we'll ever see the racing as I really enjoyed it. I think it's too. I think it's somewhat too regulated, but I, I'd see that that because of safety and sure. and that's, oh, the safety aspect's fantastic. What they've yeah. done to racetracks. Yeah. What do you think it's missing from your days? That, that how outrageous the cars were, the sound, the speeds. Um, like uh, for instance, the people in Europe loved the panels. They knew got, they weren't going to win. It's just the noise. It's that V8. I'm not applying this to speeds. I'm not applying this to drivers. I'm not applying this to, to designers. I'm applying this to the entire sport, including the PR, yeah. including the marketing. What appeals to anyone who gets involved in the sport, especially in the 80s, especially in the 90s, you know, when, when we all were paying the most attention, is a culture of fearlessness. Yeah. Where people yeah. were not afraid to push the limits yeah. of engineering, right. of driving, yeah. of cool marketing concepts, yep. and the fearlessness is gone. Yeah, I agree. Um, and and across the board, we need to stop being afraid of people leaving because of yeah. X. We yeah. need to be stop. We never want to compromise safety, but we need to stop being afraid of speed. We yeah. need to stop being afraid. Yeah. Not to say that costs is we all agree costs can go down, but I think we need to stop worrying about teams leaving. And, and, yeah. and, and hey, I'm. Definitely involved in one that's very likely going to be gone. Yeah. But we need to st series need to stop being afraid of that because I think they're overreactions. Yeah. That is what creates yeah. the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, yeah. people are going to leave or they're not. Yeah. And so the culture of fearlessness is what is completely missing right now. And with that. Yeah. With that. <laughs> hey, so. <laughs> Continental's got the Cont check. I'm <laughs> finished. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that was such a great episode. That guest really knew how to tell a story. Did you like that, John Eversley? Your dad, Ryan, who's clearly sitting next to me? You're welcome, Sean. I'm right here. All right. Thank you once again to John Eversley for telling us some amazing stories from the 1980s. I, uh, I will say I think racing would be a lot more interesting if team owners just pulled guns on each other. Uh, but, you know, that's just my own style. So, all right. Uh, I thought the best way to close out of here was uh, actually a guy that I've been a fan of for a long time, ever since he was in a band called The Honorary Title. Uh, he's since gone out and been solo for, for several years now. A guy named Jared Gorbel, uh, J-A-R-R-O-D. G-O-R-B-E-L. Uh, he's on Spotify. He's on iTunes. He's got several albums out. Uh, but there's one album out that you should definitely check out called uh, Bruises From Your Bad Dreams, uh, which uh, has one song I thought was particularly appropriate to this episode. It's called Mother Father. Yes, I am happy Well, at least that is for me Father, give me the courage Life's turned so sudden I lack the will or energy But I found someone watching over me Steering us clear of tragedy And I found someone watching over me Steering us clear of 
tragedy How can I help? What do you need? Brother I know how you struggle Just hold tight to your trouble Cause our support is getting weak Father, don't be so stubborn Remove the burden But push it on, on to me Cause I found someone watching over me Steering us clear of tragedy And I found someone watching over me Steering us clear of tragedy Cause all, all we are is a sum of the parts From those that will listen to us Cause I found someone watching over me Steering us clear of tragedy For you I'm always, always free For you I'll always be Cause I found someone watching over me Steering us clear of tragedy For you For you, I'll always.